bum para 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 bum is very fun. And of course, Saturday's long patrol topic is what doctrine would the Japanese be using for a war with the British in if 1939, if the Tsingtao incident went hot? And honestly, this has been a fun week working this one out. This has not been as straightforward as we might have thought. I might have thought, certainly other people might have thought, in terms of working out based on part of previous papers, because Japanese doctrine is a movable feast of fun. And I am saying that with a lot of love in my heart for it. It is a movable feast of fun. It seriously is a movable feast of fun. And it changes. It evolves. It keeps moving. And... Uh, what the doctrine they would have had in 1939 as the doctrine, dominant doctrine in January 1939, February was not the same doctrine they have in 1941. It's not the same doctrine they have in 1942, and it's certainly not the same doctrine they have in 1944. Anyway, hello, Peter. Hello, Stafford. Hope class goes well for you. Hello, Stafford. Well, I hope you're, uh, you're doing well wherever you are. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, Dunrick Arnhamner. Hello, Carl Wingersberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Roman Cash. Hello, M35 Benvids. Hello, Derp Squad. Hello, Paul from Chicago. What a disaster for Japan that would be. Every nation jumped in on that and given anti japanese sentiment, maybe even the US. We're going to get into this one. Hello, Matthias Slavic. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Night 6H1. What use could the RM Vittorio Veneto have been to the Royal Navy? Um, it was pretty. Let me rephrase that. The Royal Navy is never going to turn down an extra battleship. It's useful. Any extra ship is useful. They can use it to free up ships to operate elsewhere, or they can use it in a frontline role, maybe. Especially if they don't have to crew it and they don't have to support it. So, you know. I have very few questions for Sunday. It's Formula One starts the weekend. Hmm. Mm -hmm. George, I think the Shanhols could probably defeat Congo. Ooh, that's an interesting question. You know, the Shanhols could well have been using this. But we'll leave it. Let's go from one side. Hello, Sage. Hello, Wesley Phillips. Hello, Guardsman13. Hello, Bob Fry. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. I don't know. Did someone send uh, the doctor some bongo drums? No. I haven't gone full Sheldon Cooper. I like the bongo. Da 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 da. Yet. Yet. George Newman, it's hard to hit a moving target. Mm. Uh, hi, Sim Richards. Hi, Jeremy Wolf. Hello, Paul Beswick. First squad, wouldn't their doctrine be pick a fight against a prolonged naval power that they can't possibly win? Well. <sighs> okay. So, when I started off with this, the whole point is, if Sing Tsao happens, if it happens, it's because the Admiral at, in the Ashigara decides to be an idiot. I mean, literally, he decides he's going to fire his guns just to see what, because he considers an insult to Japan. And it, depending on what faction he comes from, that's actually not impossible. Let's be honest, Japan does have some very, very smart admirals, but like any navy, they also have some admirals who. You honestly don't know how the frag they got there. Let's be honest. For the Royal Navy, the key, the, the key thing would be, is Lord Cork and Ori as far away from this as possible? If he is, that's great. And I know, there are people who regularly in the comments go, but his prior career prior to Norway, he wasn't actually as bad as that. Actually, when you look at his prior career, there is usually a... Re he doesn't exactly do that brilliantly well. He, he gets promoted largely thanks to his um, <clears throat> nobility. Uh, 
Hello, Carmen Gasberg. Hello, MC Legend 13H. Hello, Benjamin Hinkliff. Hello, Anna de Paul. And the Elder Sage rebranded. Oh, and hello, Josh Mark. RM, bring Ark Roll, and they're also Pacific, probably. Oh, yes, they would have been coming along. But actually, what's interesting is what's going to affect the Japanese doctrine most is what they don't have in service. And by the way, the Kido Batai, this will be this is a, a taste of what's coming later, doesn't exist in 1939, either administratively or in terms of ships in the water. So this is going to be a fun one. And as you can see, this is page 48. Colin Cameron, uh, if the Sing Tower went hot, would we have seen the initial deployment of the RN motor gunboat in the Pacific rather than the Channel? The odds are motor torpedo boats would have been sent out to Singapore and as part of the defense or defensive forces to de defend any of the forward bases as they move forward. Um, I think it could have been a very different scenario than what happened later on. I, it's an interesting one to get into whether or not motor torpedo boats, motor gunboats become as big a part of it. I think they possibly could have been used, but it's going to be an issue. It's something we'll work into. First one, I wonder if the smart admirals would offer an olive branch to the British by having him be tried as a murderer in order to try to avoid an unwinnable war. Honestly, Mitsumasa Yonai might well try that, but um, he'd already in or sacked someone for offending the Americans, so he might. But um, for by attacking the Americans, he caught martial and sacked a naval officer. But it, it, it's not necessarily... Um, possible under this circumstance because in the nicest way what would the british expect for the thing there's a difference between accidentally bombing a ship which is on a river and actually that you can claim you sort of mistook and were just acting irrationally versus you actually attacked and sunk a british cruiser which you knew was a british cruiser which you've been involved in and which your government has presumably had access to. I mean, there, there might not be enough people they can pro they can proffer up to be executed for that one. Um, Hyder trip announcement. Thanks, in large part to Jack Ray. I'm gonna I'm gonna call him out on this because he has been absolutely so generous. Everyone has been massively generous, but Jack Ray has really been generous. I'm at three thousand four hundred pounds. I, I can't get over anyone's generosity and everyone has been far kinder than I thought they would be. But the Hyder trip, um, the dream amount was 3,600 and currently at 3,400 with five days to go. So it finishes on the 22nd and the, thank you everyone for all you've done. Um, I'm going to hold off recording the video for the 22nd till Monday so I can make sure that's up to date in terms of the details but um yeah thank you everyone it's just mm -hmm. and the odds are if we do manage to add in all three of these we'll extend this by a date by a day and be in hamilton for a day longer but me and me and uh, me and drakinafel have to have this conversation and chat with everyone and see who's going what and who's going where and it, it's going to be fun i'm looking forward to it uh, getting to play tourists in Canada has long been a dream. And after this, next year's trip, next year's trip, I will go 100 minutes, is going to be Australia. I don't know how I'm going to get to sort that one out. It's going to be by hook or by crook. But I'm going to see HMS Vampire. That's it. How does this affect the course of history? As starting World War II changes it early, changes everything. I think instead of you getting a European and an Eastern War, you get an Eastern War and then you get a European War. And I'll explain more about that as we go on, why I think that is. But I think it, I don't think the tripartite alliance, you remember, is not in, on anyone's horizon in 1939. And in the nicest way, uh, G Germany and Italy are not going to want to form an alliance with Japan when they're already at war with Britain, France, and America. There's something about Japan forming an alliance with Germany, etc., and Italy when they're looking like they're winning a war with Britain, 
there's a different scenario when it's coming to forming an alliance when Japan's already at war with Britain, France, uh, Austria, uh, France, Netherlands, and America. It's a kind of a case of, oh, that could be a losing game. That's good. Uh, yes, but the trouble is, for it to happen, all three you'd have to uh, you'd have to try all three captains plus the admiral plus the admiral ashore. Um, plus the head of customs in Sing Tao and the governor. So you'd have to try all these people. And I'm not sure Japan could try all those people, considering the various factions they would have connected on, probably the army general as well, for it to actually happen. Um, yeah, it just, it, it, you're, you're talking about, there is one thing getting a captain there is quite another putting that many admirals on trial. This is a remember what's happened in Japan. You're not talking about a state which is sort of a dictatorship or a, a scenario like that. You're talking about a state which is a polycratic, feudalistic nightmare. You're you're basically in, in nicest way for. Yonai to do that, they, he's got to also deal with Prince Hiryasu and Fushima Hiryasu, who's going to be arguing for war, and Nagano, who's going to be arguing for war, and all the others who are going to be arguing for war. There is a limit to what you can do. So, whilst, yes, in theory, that's a possible outcome, but the likelihood of that is very, very low as an alternative. MC Legend H. I recently found out the RN side class cruiser, Asia's Tiger and Blake, was still in pretty good condition and were considered to go with the fleet. Ew. What if they did, even with Matros Belfast? When, MC Legend 30H? I I'm presuming you mean Falklands War? I I I'm not sure. The Tiger class cruisers are well after 1939. Uh, sorry, uh, we're in 1939 talking about this, and I. Not sure where Tiger and Blake come into. General Dr. Clark, Japanese fleet carriers, Kaga, Sorio, and Akahiro, uh, and Akagi in Reefed. Uh, yeah, there are issues. I am going to get to that in a second. That famous battle cruise will be coming up in a question this evening. Probably. Hood will be coming up. Anyway, so, this is the Ida trip update. Thank you very much to everyone who's on. 1982 Falklands. <sighs> MC Legend 13H. Uh, mm, they were, I think they were all considered, and this is completely off the topic this evening, but as is usual with the British in war, they were considered to go, but the time taken to activate them, it was felt the war would be over by the time they are available. But they were considered because theoretically using Tiger or Blake as Commodore Clapp's command ship in um, San Carlos Bay would have been very beneficial. Uh, the firepower they'd have brought, but also the command and control facilities would have been very useful. Anyway, getting back to Japan. So today's uh, tonight's live will be structured into Japanese doctrine, the Tsingtao incident, uh, likely conflict, and the summary. Because... The more I added in, the less slides I could have, and the less slides I could. Sorry, it was limited. I, I thought it was limited to how much way you can type. Don't worry. It's just, it's more a case of, if you are going off topic, can you put the year in first? <laughs> just to help my brain, because my brain's in the 1939 mo mode, and it's going, okay, uh, there wasn't a Tiger and Blake around at this point. Shame not, because a Tiger would actually be useful. HMS Tiger would have been quite useful for this scenario. Anyway. So this is what the Afro overview is going to be. And during we're looking at Japanese doctrine, we're also going to examine some of the personalities involved. And again, there are all sorts of links down below. In fact, I'm going to take this slide to discuss the various books I've used. So, Japanese Carriers and Victory in the Pacific by Martin Stansfield. Imperial Japanese Navy in the Pacific War by Mark Style. The Imperial Japanese Navy by Nihon Kaigon. 
and uh, well, the Nihai, Nihai Kaigon by Andres J. Kersitis, which is a pretty good. How do I put this? This will tell you where admirals are. It will tell you what they're doing, where they are, what role they're in. It's kind of a less informative version, but far bigger version of this book. Shokan, the Hirohito Samurai, which gives you all the armed forces leaders, but also gives you an introduction to the various units their organizations, their chronology in the 1930s and 1940s, uh, and from the 1920s onwards, their command structures. It's invaluable. Uh, and Tagon, which is basically the English-speaking world's crib to the Imperial Japanese Navy strategy, tactics, and technology. It's not perfect, but there's a lot. There's not a lot better out there. It's very, very good. I would also add there are links down below to various articles I have used. Um, I will highlight them and quickly talk them through. So down below we have links to the Kantai Kesen doctrine, Japanese doctrine outside the Kantai Kesen, and Kantai Kesen Japanese cruisers videos by me, the Chiefs of Staff videos, which go into the various Japanese naval officers and some of their structures. But also, there is a Tsingtao incident 1939. And some sources that may help. The influence of Mahan on the IJN. And uh, this is underneath the timestamps. And the Japanese sea power. All down there, which are some pretty good sources to go and link to. It too. So, I have tried my best to give you as much information as possible. I hope it's all useful. I, I, I realize I am going to be chucking a lot of information at people this evening. And as said, the long patrol is going to come out on Saturday. That is 80 minutes long. This is, I have budgeted for three hours. I'm reckoning it's going to go over. But I want you to be able to find as many sources as you can because it's very interesting because what might have happened in 1939 tells you a lot about what does happen in 1941, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Andrew Paul, off topic question to add to MC Legend 13H. If the RN activates Tiger and Blake, just in case the Falcons well in advance for them to see service, how useful will they be for the RN? Assuming there is a possibility of retaining, the, uh, retaining them in service or reserve post Falcons War. Sorry for the division. I'm no need to worry about the division. Um, they'd have been pretty useful for the RN as command ships. And honestly, you would probably have had. This is going to sound strange, but the odds are if they're used down in the Falklands, then some sort of big command ship might be considered. Instead of Sheffield and Coventry being replaced by Type 22s, they might actually build another Super Destroyer class. They might. That could well be a possibility. If they've had to use them, the ships and command ship roles, they might well want to repeat them. It's kind of like an LPH gets built, uh, HMS Ocean, because of the experience of the Falklands War. It might well have a similar impact. Did Japan have any admirals as bad as Lord Beresford? Um, if you go down there, you will find a link to um, uh, Prince Fushima, uh, Fushima, uh, uh, Fukushima Hiroyoso. Uh, go and have a look at him. He's not as bad as Beresford, but he's certainly in a similar mould. With World War II starting early, how did the USM go involved? I will get into that. Later in the do in, later in the video.
Don Sandal, and Thomas Vanderbilt. Evening, gents, ladies. Hello. Hello, Seneca Nero. Oh. Actually, when the tight class goes, is getting worn out by 1982. Yes, but that's 1982. We're now in 1939. But they could still be reactivated for the Falklands War. It's the nicest way. Uh, in, for war in the Far East, you would have had the C-Class, D-Class, E-Class, every single cruiser the Royal Navy has activated. I mean, seriously, they would have been the Hawkins, uh, the Hawkins Effingham class would have been going, Hello, we're here! The Royal Navy would be going, Yes, we know. Uh, where can we put you that you're not going to cause trouble but are vaguely useful? I can guarantee I know which ships end up on the South Atlantic Station. <laughs> Well, no. General Barrett, again, uh, I, I was very nice to everyone, and I will go. I, I will discuss those things uh, as we get in, because I need to, uh, before I get into accelerating or decelerating the programs of ships, I need to first go into the doctrine and the strategy. And that's what I'm going to go first. Hello, Dan Freeman. Chipmunk Alex at 1.75C. And, and I hope the sound is slightly better. I've changed the cutoff brackets. I have to have it CERN on, CERN gates on, because of, um, uh, tends to be noises of my sister next door. All right. So, the this lovely rogues gallery next to me here are the Japanese senior admirals who run their combined fleet, who run who basically are in charge of their opera naval operations. Now, we start off with Admiral Oami Nagano, who was basically lost his role as Navy Minister to take over after Mitsumasa, uh, Mitsumasa Yonai was appointed after only 62 days in post to Navy Minister. So they basically swapped. And he was put in post in February 1937. However, he was replaced by Vice Admiral Zengo Yoshida in December 1937. And he would stay in post for a year and 272 days before becoming himself Navy Minister. That's the gentleman in the center of the top. Uh, he would, of course, be forced to resign as Navy Minister because he opposed the tripartite alliance as strategically uh, moribund and is stupid. Oh, hi, Melanie 1640. Now, Amitsumasa Yonai promoted his own protege, Isoroku Yamoto, into post in charge of the combined fleet in August 1939 as one of his last acts as, as Navy Minister to try and make sure the fleet had a decent admiral in charge of it, who was, in his words, uh, not a rabid dog. When I say in his words... I am paraphrasing and interpreting from a long Japanese sentence because Mitsumasa Yonai would never be so gr uh, so gush as to say rabid dog, but um, he, that is certainly what I infer from the way he's phrasing. It's phrasing and translation I've read. Uh, then we have, of course, the admirals who come after Yamoto. Uh, we have Koga Minashi. Um, Minchi, uh, Minchi, who dies in an air crash in March 1944. Uh, we have his successor, Admiral Toyoda Seomo, who became Chief of Staff in 1940, May 1945, so left the Combined Fleet. And then we have the final Chief of the Combined Fleet, Vice Admiral Kawa Isabel. This is a good example of the officers you're dealing with, but you might well notice that the ones at the top have a lot of decorations and all look a certain style. That is the style you are looking at in this period. So again, something to realize is that the Admiral who you would be, who the Royal Navy would be facing and the US Navy would be facing in 1939 is not Isoroko Yamoto. It's not. And it won't be. He's not senior enough to take the post. Basically, Mitsumasa Yonai, to get him into post, 
has to do a lot of political double dealing and has to get the emperor to back him up. When he does do in August 1939. In January 1939, in February 1939, you are dealing with Zengo Yoshida. Okay? So you're dealing with the center top. Anyone have any questions about Japanese admirals? Because this is going to be fun. <laughs> oh, oh, good Lord. There, there, there is... This chat is something to watch. Hello, Melanie6040, and hello, Abulaski. The situation where Japan is at war with France, Britain, America, and Netherlands without a European war at the same time sounds like an actual nightmare for the IGN. Yes, it would have been. Doesn't mean it wouldn't have happened. Painful, but it could have happened. You have to remember with the Japanese admirals, they are quite well trained. Did Japan have anyone as good as Fisher? I would argue they had someone better than Fisher. They did have someone better than Fisher, in my opinion. They didn't use him as well as the Britain used Fisher, but they did have someone better than Fisher. And when Japan, were there domestic naval companies in Japan at the time, or were most of these guys educated in Britain and Annapolis? Uh, and apparent, actually, they a most of them didn't actually. Some of them did go to Britain. Some went to America for our education. But most of them actually went to Germany and other places for their education. But they were educated in Japan. There were huge naval academies in Japan that were absolute stars. Uh, if you go down to the Mahan article linked below and the Mahan's influence on the Imperial Japanese Navy you'll see a whole discussion of the various academies the Japanese Navy have and what they're producing. They are very much homegrown talent. Yes, they will go and disappear off to go and visit some of the foreign uh, foreign academies. And Prince Bushimi Hiroyoshi actually spends a lot of time in Germany. This is what, That's where he learns. He's learned his stuff in the various German naval academies uh, because he preferred them to the British naval academies. But this is a very powerful officer, Prince Bashimi Hiro Yoso. He is connected to the royal family. He is connected to various other members, senior members of the royal of the ruling class. He has a lot of power. He has a lot of influence, and he has a massive grievance. He is absolutely royally and in every way imaginable upset and devastated, and feels it was treasonous what happens at the Washington Naval Treaty. Now, what he wanted was a 10-10-7 ratio. He also wanted the battleships to be slightly bigger, but he wanted a 10-10-7 ratio because whilst he realized Japan couldn't have equality, if they had a 10-10-7 ratio, they would have enough power, risk fleet theory coming in here, good old influence of Tirpitz, that America would not be sure of victory if taking on America and Japan alone in initial exchange. So therefore, they would have to be treated as, if not an equal, a Sado equal. He felt it was completely dishonourable that they were only given this position. He is, in many ways, a Beres for the style figure. He is very, it, it, it's a, he's a very honour orientated officer and very status orientated. George Newman, Miyamoto had a master's from Harvard University. He had many qualifications, he might have said. Um, Thomas Vandals, uh, well, my dear doctor, that's a clock of someone. Did they make him, uh, they use him as much? Uh, uh, he just warning would give him the right resources to develop. Um, not really. They didn't, how do I put this? We'll get into Mitsumasa Yonai next. He's the equivalent. Uh, he tries to do his best, he does his best, but the trouble is the Japanese system is different from the British system. 
in that in the Japanese system, they're out and out assassinating people who they disagree with. The the, the fights are they're very different in Britain. In, in, in Lysa's way, this is Beresford with the ability to order people killed. And who actually gets to the top job because he's chief of staff for the Imperial Japanese Navy. And he ain't leaving it. He is a prince. He is not leaving it. He is in post for a very, very long time. In fact, let's see. He is Chief of the Imperial Naval Just Staff from the 2nd of February 1932. And he serves until the 9th of April 1941. He received the rank of Marshal Admiral on the 27th of May 1932 and the colour of the Supreme Order of the Chrysanthemum in 1934. Now, there are arguments about those ranks being honorary, and you can agree with that. But I would also add the fact is he has those ranks. And in a power and status conscious society where honor, birth, uh, not so much the samurai code, but their evolution of the samurai code, their derivation of the samurai code that existed by about in this period, especially in the martial orientated parts of the Japanese society, lust of these things. These things are important. They're signs of your prowess. This is also possibly the biggest warhawk the Japanese have. He is the most bombastic, militaristic you can have. And honestly, he scares the army because they can't touch him. Yes, you can assassinate admirals if you want. You can't assassinate him because he's too close to the emperor as a blood relation. That's practically attacking the royal family. That isn't going to work. So the, several of the usual tricks the army will use for fighting him cause the trouble. It's interesting the relationship between him and Mitsumasa Yonai because they will have a bit of fights, but they also realize they need each other. Because he makes sure that no one else can, no one can get, get rid of Yonai unless the king, uh, emperor wants Yonai got rid of. And even if he wants rid of Yonai, he can't because the emperor likes Yonai. But Yonai is far better at the building, constructing ships. Admiral, uh, Admiral Pound. Ah, I didn't realize that. Makes sense. You, sound, you didn't sound foolish. As I've said before, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Darren, doesn't matter if you have the most brilliant name else in all of human history, past or brilliant, if he doesn't make it past the Senate because he didn't have the right connections. Hmm. Hello, Hussein. Could the Japanese economy afford that many ships in the early 20s? They couldn't afford to match, but 10 10 7 they could have managed. Let's put it this way if you do it, uh, it based on 15 ships, and the reason the Royal Navy and the, uh, the US Navy didn't want it was they were basing off, they wanted to have 15 capital ships. That's what the powers that be in Congress wanted to have. So 5 5 3 equates to nine Japanese ships to 15 American ships, a nice, easy su superiority. The Japanese wanted seven, 10 to seven, and the British basically said that if it's a 10 to seven ratio, then we need 20, because then that gives us a six ship majority. The US Congress didn't want to fund 20 capital ships. The Royal Navy could have done the 20 capital ships, but the US Navy didn't want, uh, US Navy didn't want them. Or rather, the US Congress didn't want them. The US Navy would have quite liked 20 ships. They could have completed that, 20 ships. They could have afforded it, and Japan could have afforded 14 ships. Japan couldn't afford a naval race where they were trying to compete for the top place. But having the right to build up to 14 ships would have been very, uh, how do I put this, uh, good for the Japanese morale. It, it probably would have meant they would have slowed down their building of cruisers and destroyers because they'd have been building concentrating capital ships. But again, that doesn't necessarily help the hurt the rest of us.
Uh, it's a 10 10 7 ratio, um, Knights of Kerakor, not 10 10 7 ships. Uh, as I said, the ratio for the Japanese was five, uh, the Japanese at Washington and uh, was 5 5 for UK, ER, UK and US, and 3 for Japan. Uh, the Japanese wanted it 10 10 7. And either way, they realized the, um, the US Navy and the Royal Navy would uh, uh, require a minimum of a six superiority in numbers. That's good. Assassination of Prince wouldn't be able to be explained as doing something instead of the Emperor, even if law held it was even if law held it was illegal. Assassination of Ambrose was. Mm, there's all sorts of fun things. That's a That's Bismarck is German topic. Well, uh, but on the subject of if Bismarck's ever put, uh, built, how is Hood remembered by people today? That depends on what Hood does in service. If Bismarck's not built. Probably it's just forgotten, but you know. Hello, Bishon. Andrew Paul, uh, 553, uh, 1.75, 1.75. Why not go 88533 with US and UK baseline of 16? That seems closer to what Japan wanted, yet not too far off what the UK, US and UK wanted. Yeah, but that that's getting. The, the the US were just being okay. There are so many things in the Washington Treaty we can get into. That could be a whole other view. The decisions made by various powers in the Washington Treaty that get into law that may uh, that uh, cause everyone endless trouble could be a whole other video. So final, uh, Admiral Peace. Well, I remember you and I mostly for that. I wasn't here on the anti-war vote in uh, in August nineteen forty-five. To an extent, uh, Mitsumasa Yonai is one of the most, he is, as I put it, the equivalent of Henderson in the Japanese Navy, in that he is the driving force behind most of their modernization construction, most of their carrier development, most of their destroyer and cruiser development in the, in 19, late 19, in the 1930s. He is possibly one of the finest naval minds that has ever been in the world. He is considered one of the three best admirals the Japanese Navy ever had. I would consider him one of the top ten admirals of the Second World War. Even though he doesn't get to fight a battle and doesn't get to command a battle, it can, it, strategically he is... Certainly one of the smartest ones, and the Allies were honestly very lucky they didn't have him commanding the other side. Because if anyone could have pulled off something riotously upsetting, it pr wouldn't have won the war for Japan, but would have caused a lot of trouble for us, it would have been Mitsumasa Yonai. He is also one of the most level-headed and sensible officers they have. If you want to go for a Fisher equivalent, you are looking at him. But he's also someone who doesn't want to build Yamato and uh, Yamo, uh, the Yamato class because he considers them a waste of resources to put all that just into some battleships, which are going to wreck his yards for years. Uh, he was peace faction, but let's put it this way: he was peace faction before the war began, and he was peace faction because he didn't think Japan and its state could win. And interesting enough, the reason he cites it is because of the lack of development and investment in Japanese infrastructure. <laughs> what do you know? A, smart, a very smart admiral who goes, yeah, yeah, the, the, everyone else is talking about, we have all these ships, we can win, our sailors are brilliant. He's going, yes, our sailors are great. What's our infrastructure like again? Excuse me, everyone, infrastructure? What's the infrastructure like? And they're all going, but our sailors are brave and honourable. Infrastructure? I, I love this guy. Let me take a Washington Treaty, Why Wednesdays? Title for a new series. Uh, it could be. It could be coming time to go serious. Hello, uh, DGV40. That's good. Often excuses are forgiven by courts of Japan that the killers claimed they were acting out of patriotic devotion to Emperor. Uh, the reason killing family members, a uh, family member wouldn't work. Oh, yes. And let's be honest, killing. Uh, also, there's the fact, it's like, 
nice this way, the people who attempted to kill Yonai ended up getting killed by Yonai. This, uh, the trouble is, again, with him and Fushima Hiroyasio, both of them are very heavily samurai, samurai trained by their families. Uh, Hiroyasio by retainers, Yonai by his father. His father trained him pretty much from the age of three in how to fight. Uh, there is a story that he once took down an assassin with a fork. I'm not sure about that one. I do know he he that there were he did take out several assassins in the 1930s who decided that they would end up in the wrong place vis-a-vis -vis his car. Um, this is this is a very nice gentleman. He you know, look at that face. He looks nice and kind. But um, apparently he is quite capable and quite happy to kill you if you're trying to kill him. Gigi Hamlet, one Japanese arm rolls over what happened in the naval war with the US German. Replied that all the American sa uh, sailors would desert. Yeah, that was um, this one. Well, this one said something similar to that. I think. I will throw in the London treaties as well. If I'm, if I'm going to do the Why Naval Treaties Why series, I will do the full gamut of naval treaties. It's like talking to the guys in the army and no one remembers a little thing called logistics. Mm. Yeah, well, I learned a couple of things things here about Japanese infrastructure, like pouring crude oil into your tanks and boilers. My goodness, I thought the high seas were worse. Apparently not. Yeah, again, <laughs> this is not... <laughs> um, if we go back to this admiral in the top, um, Admiral uh, Zengo Yoshida, the reason he felt the tripartite alliance wasn't worth it is because his requirement for a tripartite alliance was that the Germans share their oil, their coal to oil, their ability to man manufacture synthetic oil facilities with the Japanese, because they have plenty of coal, but they, of course, don't have oil. And he feels that even though it is ruinously expensive and difficult, the ability to make enough synthetic fuel, the synthetic oil from coal, would be a tremendous advantage for Japan in any future war. If they set up sufficient plant, uh, sufficient plants. Assassins, do you mean impromptu speed bumps? Uh, possibly, but I think at one point he might have reversed over one. Fair enough. Uh, Admiral, Admiral Yonai was right in always one. Admiral Yonai is. <laughs> let's put it this way. Um, if it's possible to have, you know, so let, let's put it this way. I, 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 my theory. I have three admirals who I would like to do a book about comparing at some point one in in future. Henderson and Yonai are two of them, and the third one there is an American admiral who I will be talking about and once we get into the cruiser. So I'm going to keep that quiet. But those three admirals, seriously, if they could have formed a collective, would have taken over the world, probably no spree. <laughs> there would have been a United Earth Empire under their control. Vision, <laughs> um, the, uh, the actor. So Yamura played both Yamoto, uh, Yamato and Yonai in Toro, 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 and Japan's Long Day. Two really great films. Yes. The actor, so Yamura. <laughs> um, Aaron Evans, what infrastructure was Japan neglecting the most? In his uh, in his arguments, they didn't have enough shipyards, enough dry docks, and they didn't have fuel enough fuel facilities. Uh, he felt there was also a need to improve Japan's internal logistics to make up for in case of coastal in case of interdiction of coastal trade. He's a very very smart admiral. Vision. If a lecturer, I think I would show Toro Toro in Japan song say great film but uh, guns to conflict. I think I played a surrender speech from nineteen seventy seven film MacArthur. Hmm. 
Andrew wrote, ah, an admiral who is not only level-headed and understands how a war will be fought, but can also handle his own in a fight. Are there any books he wrote or sources for his logic? And Rihanna is someone I feel that a detailed reading into world would be a very good idea. On In English language, no, but I have been told there is a work in Japanese which was compiled from his papers by his family. I'm not sure how much of a print run there was, but I would love to get hold of it dearly. And it, honestly, you, his family still has his papers, apparently, and I would like to see them because he seems to be an incredibly interesting and cool person. The stories, it, this is going to sound strange, there are so many different stories around about this guy. It's difficult sometimes, even if I go on the policy that about a third of them are probably true. But if any third of them are true, then he has one amazing life. Nice Yanai not wanting to body Yamoto clearly should be taken as Yamoto was a waste of resources. Hmm. I can't guess. A domestic semantic fuel, at least aviation fuel production is priced in war, especially in hindsight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because you shifted in reverse doesn't mean it's not a speed bump anymore. Um, final, but if you don't even have refineries, what's the point of having synthetic oil plants? Although sink oil doesn't have to be cracked, it's more pure, if I remember. Pretty much, you can make synthetic oil to the, your standards. It's not. It's an incredibly energy exhaustive process, but both Yonai and um, Naga, uh, uh, Yonai and um, I always get his. I always want to say Nagano, but it's not Nagano. It's um, Yoshida. Both went. Uh, this is something we need. And actually, do you want know something? Is Hirioso backs them up, and one of the reasons why Hirioso ends up going is because it, get, it ends up not being chief of staff anymore, is he upsets the army and quite a lot of the, gov uh, of the government quite so much over his complaining that Yonai and y uh, y Yonai and um, Yoshida were correct. They needed the synthetic fuel plants. He still wanted to go to war in 1941 because he thought they could get the oil. But, you know, they were all going, we need the synthetic oil plants. General, I will have to apologize for knowing this. I will say, if you want a more complete description of Mitsumasa Yonai, there is a video linked to down below in the description, which is the video from the Chief of Staff, Allied Chief, Access Chief of Staff series. So I've done a video on him. I've done a video on all, pretty much all the Chiefs of, Access Chiefs of Staff because that was a key project I wanted to get, I wanted to do. Wait a minute. Coastal trade? Japan traded all their stuff via the coast? Imagine. Yeah. Japan didn't have as many railways as they needed. Or like any. That's good. I it, actually, again, uh, again. This is one of the interesting things, and this is one of the stories, was when he was asked where to build these plants, he, sa he, ma he, made, a quite a he made quite a clever point. He said, well, we have coal, uh, coal mines which are now no longer in use as coal mines. Surely we can use them to produce oil. Now, again, I'm not sure about that quote. I found it on a website, and I went, that's a fun quote. Where's your source? You've got no source for it. So he probably didn't say it. But it's also something I could imagine from the stuff I have seen him say, him saying. Because he had studied the British, and where did the British store all their oil for their ships? In coal mines and various mines, which they've converted. They've dug into mountains, and they've converted the mines into to oil storage facilities. It could well be what he would do. MC Lane fit in. If all four Yamotos were completed early, ready for a war with the Western powers, how should it affect the Japanese strategy and how fast would the Japanese US name and Royal Navy for what time response? 
if the Amateurs had actually been built, it depends if they know about them before or after the war begins. If they know about them before the war begins, then they are doing a crash building program. After the war started, then there is issues. But it's a case of you have to know about them and you have to know what they are before you can build something to counter them. The British look at them, the British think they have 17-inch um, guns. So what you're saying is crude oil would work great as a power input for the sitting coal production. To an extent, but also you could use coal or you could use hydroelectric power, I think. That's one of the scenarios they count. Um, and Bijan, the argument between War Minister Anna Anai and Navy Minister Yonai over the Potsdam Declaration at Canada meeting in Japan's long invasion, the longest day is a great scene. It is. They might a B-29s would have ruined it, but again, at what point in the war would they have ruined it, and how much would the fuel production earlier in the war have changed things? This is the point. You're, uh, by the point that the B-29 doesn't come into service at the beginning of the war. It's a few years before it gets into service, and a few years before it gets into the range. Well, Cody's doing the unsourced one we mentioned. The unsourced one was the idea that, you know, we uh, he said... Um, we have spent coal mines. When they asked about the, where to put such fuel plants, because the army said, well, we've got no land to put them on. We've got spent fuel, coal mines. Can't we, do, we can turn those into something. They, they, we can make those productive once more. Basically, is what he says. Vision. Japan had a pretty good rail system, but it was narrow gauge and a single track with a big focus on passenger traffic. Could not replace coastal shipping when, when USN AAC closed off waterborne freight. Vision, you just answered your own question. I said Japan didn't have enough railways, as I said. And I, think, I, I, I love the, the thanks for the clarification and for the point about it. It's narrow gauge and it's mostly passenger traffic. But you see, that is the problem. It's passenger, it's passenger and narrow gauge traffic. As far as freight and movement of goods go, it, there might as well not be that. And this is the problem for them. This is the problem for all of them. That's what, yeah, they probably will see it, but um, there are ways of dealing with things. You can stick in pipelines, so you uh, the, uh, which are buried, like Britain did with the airfields. There are all sorts of options for what you can do, to protect it, if you're prepared to put in the work and be inter and be smart about it. And yes, it's not gonna. This is gonna be nothing perfect, but it's gonna take on a while. That's right. What would be uh, the, the part of Jai Jane's strategy for sinking high value targets like the Royal Navy of H.M.S. Hood, given she could decimate the state Japanese commerce? Well, here is the other problem. And this is the problem for Japan in terms of commerce protection, and we'll be getting to that by the end. That's when we get into what the British strategy would be and what the Japanese response would be. Yes, you're dealing with all those things about Japan, but you're also, and in this one, we're discussing what their doctrine would have been in 1939 for a war which started at that point. They are still developing their, na their development of naval aviation and their aviation doctrine. You also have the point that there are officers who are trying to move the Japanese aviation development into a different way. And in January 1939, those officers are far more in ascendant. Again, this is the Minister of the Navy in January 1939. He is far more, uh, he is pushing for far more of the training. In fact, quite a lot of the reforms and the stuff which do help the Japanese Navy's aviation production and the, uh, the Navy's production, not the Army's, but they do copy some of the methodologies, come are put forward during his period. 
So again, if he's in charge of the war mobilization, how might that affect the setup of the Navy? First of all, how long would it have taken the Japanese to build uh, Japan to build some new refineries? I imagine it would take a few years to get them up to speed for infrastructure and working knowledge. Well, this is the point. He starts arguing for them before 1937. So if they had started building, this is an interesting point about Yonai and quite a lot of these officers is they're going, if you think war's going to be coming in the 1940s, we have to start preparing for it now. It's another thing, again, if you have synthetic oil production, even some synthetic oil production, then when the Americans start causing, start stopping oil imports and all those things, you are far less exposed. You know, the point that a lot of these admirals and to an extent Hiriyoso and most of this rogues gallery all put forward is that Japan backs itself into a corner. They're in that corner in 1939. They're in that corner from about 1936 onwards. They're in that corner, arguably, from 1934, 1933 onwards. And they back themselves into that corner. And the point a lot of these officers are making is that you need to reform. You need to have this infrastructure in order to give yourself freedom. So the Japanese are in a weak position of their own making. This has to be understood. Yes, it would cost money. Yes, they haven't had the, the strongest economy. But they have a strong enough economy. They have an advanced enough economy. So you would probably be looking at two years for to build a starting building to get them into service and get them up. They could have done it, especially if they'd started in 1936. 35. And even if 5D7, they could have done it. There's no perfect solution. There's just flexibility, especially in war cameras. Exactly. The whole point is synthetic oil production is incredibly, incredibly energy intensive. It's incredibly user. It uses a huge amount of coal. But it's better than nothing. And it gives you time. General Barrow, sure in the 1950s, the railways would be improved if a little tight. Again, that would require actual investment. Peter speak, cake gauge is good enough for moving freight. See how Africa? Yes, it is, if you're running on cake gauge. I no, Bishop, no need to be sorry. I'm just, when you add in the point, I clarify beyond it to build up on it because you do add some good sort of thing. Bishop, the statement Japan will very big at coastal coast shipping. Trucks dominate on land. Rail carries very little freight. Yes, and the trucks aren't that uniform either. Hmm. Vision. Plans for the Shinkansen date from the 1940s. Japan wanted to build a standard gauge truck line, trunk line rail system since the 1920s, but funding was an issue. Politics sent dollar, dollar, dollars to local lines. Yes. Uh, vision. Japan's rail system depended on maritime ferries too. Worst economics blow of World War II was USN carrier craft sinking Hokkaido rail car ferries in 1945. Kyushu and Honshu were connected by tunnel by World War II. Ooh. Vision. Hokkaido was, the, was a big source of coal. Sinking car ferries deprived factories on Honshu of coal. Japan has three foot six inch gauge cape gauge, thanks to British uh, advisors. It does, but you have to actually use it as cape gauge. Right. Carl Gazzard, a recent fuel. I recall like 0.95 Reichsmark for the litre of synth fuel versus other, and six Fenix uh, for normal aviation fuel. True. It's incredibly expensive, but it's again, it's a choice you make. If you're operating oil powered ships 
and you have no secure source of fuel, you're in trouble. So, would it, uh, let's look at the Kantai Kessen Doctrine, because the Kantai Kessen Doctrine is the one most talked about, and because I like this slide from my Kantai Kessen video. Uh, the doctrine for Kantai Kessen would involve achieving a local superiority of force that allows you to overwhelm your enemy to develop uh, and deliver a devastating blow onto them. This is normally achieved by a concentration of the total fleet force. This is why the combined fleet exists. The combined fleet is the concentration of the Japanese force. It's rooted in an interpretation of Mahan. It's rooted in a, Mah a very Japanese interpretation of Mahan, but it's also rooted in a post Toshima, I would say, in extent, almost war drunk version of Japan. How do I explain this? Okay, the Japanese and a lot of these admirals subscribe to the decisive battle theory, at least in public. And there is a small problem, though, with it. So, you achieve the Battle of Toshima. That is a great, amazing victory. That is a victory which re echoes through the ages. One of the greatest naval victories of all times. There's a problem with it. It looks massive. It looks great. But Rosalensky, as much as I love him, respect him, think, and I've said this in the Long Patrol, and I'll say this again now, there should be a statue to him in every Russian shipyard and naval base around the world going, this guy is what the Russian Navy logistically hopes to achieve because he frankly could manage to achieve a feat of leadership and logistics which has yet to be surpassed by anyone considering the resources he had and the reliability of forces he had and the personnel he had and what how much he actually managed to get out of the freaking battle of Tsushima. But the fact is the second and third Pacific squadrons weren't defeated at Tsushima. They'd been defeated a long time ago. They were running low on supplies, they were running low on spares, they were running low on train crew, everything, by the time even once they get to Tsushima. They're at the end of a they're they're at the end of a non-existent logistics support line. They have sailed all the way around the world the hard way. And they've come right into your back door. <sighs> Here is the problem of applying that doctrine now. Oh, that's a lovely battle, got them. If you're applying that doctrine against the Russians, yes, they might do it. But would the British or the Americans be in the same position? The Brits have bases in Singapore and would probably evolve and move their forces up from there. Uh, they would bring their fleet out to Singapore, refit, repair it, do all their things they need, and then move up. They have a dry docks. They have floating dry docks. They can move to help assist with forces at Singapore. They have all sorts of things they can send there. Yeah, that's 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 not going to be the same scenario, is it? That's not going to be the same scenario as the Russians. And the Americans, they have all the fleet based in the Philippines and the forces there and the support facilities there. So, again, it's not going to be the same scenario. You either have to do your best to make it the scenario by knocking out the Philippines, but then that's what that's going to push the Americans back to Hawaii. If you knock out Singapore, where does that push the British back to? Salon? That's still not halfway round the world. That's, in fact, the whole way round the world. Let's be honest. The Russians have to go down the Atlantic Ocean, north and south, around the Cape, across the Indian Ocean, um, and into, up through the South China Sea, and finally get beaten up in the East China Sea. There is, this is just not a good trip to do. Yeah. You don't the, that the British and the Americans are not going to be at to the same extent as the Russians. So you have a problem automatically with the Kantai Kessin doctrine, because and also let's be honest, there was pretty much parity of force. I know people like to add up numbers and all sorts of things, but honestly, the Japanese ships, uh, the war, actual warships versus warships, not including monitors and all the other things which are added on and the freaking gun catcher. Um, all that stuff. That doesn't really... Uh, there is parity of force. 
you're not going to be dealing with parity of force when you're dealing with the Americans and British. Hmm. Kendrick Cox, the RN doesn't have to worry about upsetting the channel fleet by shooting at trawlers either. No. <laughs> Thomas Amazon. Ah, finally, a person who appreciates Rosensky. This guy had the Russian bells and he got there a lie. And all... <laughs> that alone is a complete feat. Seeing his, uh, he was sailing Russian pre general so there is just so much to be. Rosensky is... I, I have great respect for him in uh, what he actually achieved. Dan Freeman, the IGN of February 1941 is very different to the uh, beast of the IGN in December 1941. And the Japanese are in this scenario facing a war they've stumbled into rather than one they prepared themselves for. Yep. This is not going to be good. So, key points to look for in a Kansai Kessen, and I always remember this. Generic, is it a, against a significant portion of the enemy fleet? Is it a made a majority of portion or even whole of the Japanese fleet on operation? Because of the latter requirement, it will tend to be conce conceived as taking place closer to Japan, as the risk of a long-range deployment means that the enemy fleet might go round you and attack Japan itself. Adaptable, it will not be applied the same way against the weaker power as it will be a superior one. A weaker power, the Japanese fleet would seek out. A superior power, they would want to come to them. I think Japan still goes for a decisive battle. But I have a feeling they don't get it if they're fighting a British. Especially not if they're fighting a British-led Pacific campaign. And that is the point. If the Americans might want to dominate it, but if the British are the wounded party and the British are the ones mobilizing the Allies, even if the British do, and the Americans do join in, the odds are the British take the lead. And also there's that pesky little thing, as I've said before. The American and the British uh, navies are, pa are pa on par on paper. But whereas the Royal Navy has been built up to the limits of the paper, the US Navy hasn't in 1939. So actually, in real terms, the British will probably be sending more ships. That's probably going to shock a few people listening here, but that's the reality. The British in 1939, the Americans and the British are equal on paper. But in reality, the Royal Navy has a lot more ships available to it. So, this is what I tend to put mm, as being a key point of... Japanese philosophy when it comes to war fighting. Uh, Taikan Kiyoshugi, big ships and big guns. Now, Japanese ship construction honestly comes down to this. You notice they don't say balanced ships, they don't say balanced armor. They're not big ships, big armor, big guns, or big ships, big speed, big guns. No, it's big ships, big guns. And this is a this affects Japanese construction, but also affects the orientation of Japanese construction. One of the interesting things is that Metsumasa Yonai, this is very much Hiryoso's doctrine. And Hiryoso has been pushing this as the Japanese philosophy. And this is one of the reasons why, again, I say Washington Treaty has a lot to answer for. Because let's put it this way. Let's say you do say. The limit for everyone is going to be for the U.S. Navy and the, Jap and the Royal Navy is going to be twenty ships, and for the Jap uh, twenty ships and the Japanese are allowed a seven to ten ratio in capital ships, six to ten, a five five three ratio in everything else, but a seven uh, a seven to ten ratio in capital ships alone. So the Japanese are allowed fourteen. 
And let's say for even numbers, they say, right then, we're going to allow 40,000 tons per ship. So the Royal Navy gets an allow and the US Navy gets allowances of 800,000 tons for their 20 capital ships. The Japanese Navy get an allowance of 560,000 tons for their capital ships. And yeah, maybe we go, we'll probably go 10, 10, 7, 3. So, you know, the or probably, actually, honestly, the um, uh, the Italians and the French would probably want eight capital ships, so they'd each get three hundred twenty thousand tons for their car, for their battle, uh, for their ships. That would have made them happy, and forty thousand tons you can build a very good capital ship on. But no, the bright spot, I say, forty thousand tons sand displacement, you can build a very good capital ship on. Um, and it would make sense because what's the newest capital ship in service in the world at that point? HMS Hood, as I was arguing in Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday's video. Yes, Wednesday video. Um, she's 41,200 tons in standard as far as the British keep declaring her. And they're allowed to keep her. She is the newest capital ship in service. It would have been logical for the people to base the requirement, uh, base the sta uh, base. The sizing of capital ship people are built to, to bit that and go, that's the ceiling now. This is the largest vessel in service. Okay, we're not going to allow them to be that big, but we're going to allow everyone, we're going to, uh, the, because of the British inefficiency claimings, but we're going to allow everyone to build up to 40,000 tons. And suddenly people are happy because they are able to build something. They are able to build, build with pride and all these things. But How do I put this? Sometimes people don't realize when to quit when they're already ahead. The people who didn't want to spend money in the US Congress, combined with the people who felt that restricting naval armaments completely would bring peace, pushed. And they took some were allied by members in the British government and members in the French and the Italians who all felt the same. Peace would be secured by this. But what they really do is they limit themselves and they manage to make it so that it's impossible. The Japanese are never going to be able to satisfy it on a ship they can build, which is 35,000 tons or less. They're always going to go over it. 40,000 tons allows you to build something decent, hood equivalent. So instead of you constantly having the, oh, hood's the largest ship in the world and the British have her. You'd be able to go, well, that matches in against ours. It's inefficient. It's an older, it's a pre-World War. It's a World War I design. Ours is a post-World War I. It would have been an ego trip, but it would have been enough of one that it would have stopped them feeling inadequate in comparison. It would have stopped them worrying. As Knights of Kate has pointed out earlier, Hood was a very scary beast for the Japanese. Renown, Repulse were very scary beasts for the Japanese. There's a reason the British send them to the Far East on those visits. Because they are the scary beasts for them when they're dealing with the Japanese and the Americans, because they can ruin their trade. And they know it. And that makes them feel insecure. And if you feel insecure after a treaty, you are not going to follow the treaty and it is going to become a source of up the frustration, a source of upset, and potentially a source of future conflict. You have to be very careful when you're wording treaties to make sure your uh, both sides feel equally dissatisfied but also equally satisfied and neither side feels insecure the problem is by fixing the ratio at 553 they permanently limited their numbers and by reducing the ship size to 35,000 tons they made them feel weak in comparison with hood so not only did they not have and feel they had enough ships they didn't feel they had big enough and powerful enough ships and big ships, big guns is a tenant of Japanese philosophy. It's codified really in the 1920s and 1930s, but it has been around since before then. Taiken Kyoshugi is important to Japanese naval philosophy and their understanding of themselves. And stepping on it, and stepping on it, is one of the re things which contribute to World War II. And before people start bringing up going, well, could Japan afford those capital ships? They would have been tight. I do admit it. 
But probably what they would have done to afford them is they would have curtailed their production of other ships. So you deal with a Japanese Navy, which, like the US Navy, had capital ships. Woohoo! But didn't have enough escorts and didn't have enough cruisers. So couldn't actually really go to war. And that would be fine. They'd have looked good. They'd have felt strong. They'd have felt big and powerful. They'd have actually been weak and they'd have known it. But they'd have felt they looked strong enough that they didn't have to worry about it. And that's the point. So the Kante Kessin is like the Ecole Jeune Le Grea with the battleships. It has contradictions, no? It's a good operational doctrine, but not strategic. Pretty much. This is the strategy which I think was most applicable to the British. Uh, the Yugeki Zengen Sakazu, or the interception attrition operations. 41,125 tons, according to the HMS Hood Association. 41,200 tons, according to the British submissions to the Washington Naval Treaty. But I'm not going to get involved. I, I Leave it be. Vision. So if Washington tonnage limits were more realistic, 40,000 tons of battleship and 15,000 tons of cruiser, there would be less cheating and maybe then peace. Yes, because the moment you start cheating on things is the moment you start lying to each other. The moment you start lying to each other is when this, you start breeding distrust. Because if you're lying, you presume everyone else is lying, which means you no longer trust each other, which means you can't agree on anything. So, Scott, uh, the Kandai Kessin is quite removed from junior colors. It doesn't really consider a trade. It boils down to win the decisive battle, then, uh, then they surrender. Yeah, but there is something similar to that in the Junicol, in that the idea is the Junicol is they come for you and then you go for them. And basically the idea for the Kantai Kessen is they come for you, you blow them up, and then you don't, you control the seas. So it does have a trade trade section in it. That's good. Mahan held that you win the size of battle, then you control the sea to cut off enemy trade, then they can't continue war, then they surrender. Hello, glowworms. It's fun. Anyway, so the interception attrition operations is what this comes down to. And as you can see, I've got this stricter up, written up as I've got the quote from Yoshihirama, which applies to their preparations for fighting America. Now, honestly, I can translate this into applying on how you would have fight the British. The point becomes, do the Japanese are doctrinally, the Japanese are committed to taking out the Philippines. Interesting enough, you know, if a war starts the British, do they do that anyway? That's something we're going to be debating anyway. But again, for the British, I would presume they would chuck the submarines forward into the South China Sea. And they would have to split the submarine force between the Eastern Atlantic, Eastern, uh, Eastern Pacific, and the Western Pacific to cover the British and American Axis approach. Because remember, in, 19, in January 1939, the US Navy is still in San Francisco. They're not in Hawaii. Okay? That's not where the battle fleet is. And honestly, you would have to be a very, very short-sighted Japanese admiral, if you go, right, then I will just focus all my summary. Even if the J Americans don't announce they're getting involved, and if you don't attack the Philippines, no admiral is going to, it should be that myopic that they do not watch the Americans as well. But the point is, the, ja the Japanese submarines are supposed to monitor the movements of the main American fleet, and then start attacking once they get closer. So, this starts to make interesting as doctrine in that the submarines in Japanese doctrine are reconnaissance tools, information gathering tools. And one of the first rules about information is you do not fight for information because the moment you fight for information, you reveal you know it. The moment a submarine fires a torpedo at you, you know the, the enemy fleet, you as a fleet know if you've been fired at that the enemy know where you are. And you start acting as if the enemy know where you are. 
Whereas, as long as the end of the submarine stays quiet and doesn't get detected, you don't know you've been detected. They know you've been detected. Now, the interesting problem there comes from, well, how do they get the information back to the uh, to the uh, their own side about your movements without revealing their position? Because the moment they start transmitting on the radio, that's going to be picked up. The Japanese have various ideas for this, but Honestly, I'm not sure how any uh, how good any of them would be. <sighs> anyway, so but, uh, the idea is you have submarines as the outer layer doing the reconnaissance, and then uh, then uh, then a tritting as you get closer. Then naval aircraft and aircraft based on islands would inv be involved in striking the fleet during daytime. And then at night time, there would be cruisers and destroyers supported by fast battleships. Please note that fast battleships would deal a major blow to the American fleet in a night attack. Now, here is the interesting problem you start to get into. When you're dealing with the British involved in this. So, the British don't have armoured carriers exactly available in 1939, but they do have a fighter doctrine worked up. And the British fighter doctrine is air defence of the fleet, and they also have radars. So Yes, it's not being battle-tested and honed by the Mediterranean, so I can't claim that, or Norway and various other things, but it is there. I also think it's worthwhile considering the fact that the British do have plans and underway development of the uh, Supermarine Seafire, the sea, uh, the gull-winged uh, sort of Spitfire aircraft, and I wouldn't be surprised if that gets accelerated into production. Rather like what happens with the Spitfire and the Hurricane, I wouldn't be surprised if the argument is, look, the Navy's off fighting in the Far East. They've just got their fleet air on. They need those aircraft to defend their fleet, mobilize them, build them. So that could well enter service quite quickly. Would it be Merlin powered is an interesting thing rather than Griffin powered? I'm not sure, but it would be interesting. And uh, we'll get into what the Royal Navy would do and sort of deal that. And then Yogeki Sakusen, or Amber strategy. This is an important part of Japanese doctrine the idea of doing a strategic, even if not a tactical ambush. It's based on having information about your enemy's movement, but denying information to them so you can surprise them. That night attack, especially, is often linked to, as part of the attrition strategy, is often linked into your okay, Kisak percent. It's supposed to be out of the blue as try. However, there is a small problem for the Japanese when you're versus the British versus the Americans. The British are absolutely paranoidly obsessed with as submarines. They have a absolute paranoia bordering on um, uh, it, it's bordering on a an actual physical mental block on the something. In that the Royal Navy, the moment war starts, start zigzagging. They do not. So basically, the entirety of World War II, I don't think a Royal Navy ship ever proceeds anywhere in a straight line. I do not. The moment war starts, they just immediately go, War has started. We will, we will, they're going like this, going, War started. Zoom, 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 zoom. The whole time after that. And I think pro that's going to have an impact on Long Lance operations because. Long Lance is based on ambushing an enemy who is still proceeding in what I would call movement order. So still proceeding in straight lines and, you know, convoy is, they're, they're not thinking of an attack, whereas the British would be automatically acting as if there's a submarine out there. They don't, I'm not saying they know about Long Lance as in the torpedo which the surface ships would use, but because of their fear of a submarine with a torpedo, they would be doing the wag 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 the whole time, the zigzags. So that could affect the efficacy of the amber strategy, but it still probably have an impact. I think less sinking, more damaging. So Scott, as I mentioned, Japanese doctrine never really had a plan for cutting off trade, but mainly because no one they uh, have a major war with was unrolled to trade disruption by Japan. Pretty much.
Um, but the Japanese do have some, uh, the, the Japanese do have the idea that if they destroy your whole fleet, then they can go and attack your trade in other sort of things. But they don't think they can attack it before they attack your fleet. Because let's be honest, to get to most of the American trade, which goes across the Atlantic, they first have to get into the Atlantic Ocean, which means they have to beat the Pacific Fleet. Uh, to get to British trade, they also have to get into the Indian Ocean and into really into the Mediterranean Atlantic, which means they have to get past Singapore. So they have ideas for it, but it's not going to happen until after they defeated the fleet. Colonel Andrew Cox, the Kandai Kesson assumes the enemy actually wants to meet you mano a mano, rather than contain the Ajayan into region around Japan, secure British trade and resupply, then starve Japan out. Yeah, this is going to be the problem, because that is pretty much the British doctrine for how to defeat Japan. Starve them. Um... Nightingale, by sending, so by sending Hood and Repulse around the world in the early 1920s and showing off Hood as much as they did, they made the IJN feel adequate and we killed off the Amagi. Yes. Now... You have to remember, both the Japanese and the British have a lot of development and doctrine for night warfare. It's different, but I would never, I would never say one is better than the other. I would say they're different, but they're equal. I, both of them are obsessed with night fighting, and I would say this comes from the Japanese study of work with the British during World War One, and they picked it up from the lessons of Jutland. I would say the Japanese become almost as infected with the idea of night fighting as the British do. And it's interesting that the Americans who join the war far later than the Japanese do in that sort of regard are less impacted by Jutland and therefore less focused on night fighting. But there again, for the Americans, it makes sense because fighting in the day is going to suit the fleet with larger numbers. Fighting at night puts you at a disadvantage if you have puts you at a disadvantage if you have large numbers. So you have to be more, more careful about where you shoot. So, because you're more likely to hit one of your own people if you make a mistake. So, the point is, the Japanese and the British have quite advanced night doctrines. So, you could see some really interesting night battles in this kind of conflict. Don't recount home. What started? Quick, get the helmsman drunk so he can't steer in a straight line. The helmsman is ever sober? This is the Royal Navy. Stop casting such absurdism. Um, room. Somehow the RM managed to not only win World War, win World War I, but with the exception of BT, mostly managed to learn from it too. Who said success of British arrogance? <laughs> yeah. There is a whole interesting discussion going on on Bomb Blast on V-36. Hmm. So. Here is the other joy. We have the Tekiyo uh, Kokobara uh, Kokobo Hosin. Uh, Imperial Defense Policy versus the Tekoho Yohei Koryo. Imperial Defense Doctrine. Now, broadly speaking, they agree in one major point. Navy shall conduct... Operations aimed at annihilating the seaborne force of the enemy in so far as possible by forestalling him, and the army at gaining the advantage of holding the initiative by rapidly concentrating the required forces in an area before the enemy can do so. Hello, Night Heron Productions. Been here half an hour, so sorry if you've answered this already. How would you, uh, from the Iron Fleet, would there be a battle cruiser squadron or even a courageous squadron escorted by the battle cruisers? Um, I would uh, the battle cruisers would certainly be part of the th rapid deployments to the Far East. Um, how quickly they get there and what they do, they probably then be doing surface raiding operations. They might, uh, it might be a pair of them go out. You might have Hood and Renown, uh, Hood and Repulse going out together. Uh, Renown is an interesting one because. Now, Renown is technically uh, and she said it goes into upgrade in 1936, which is based on War Spite, and she's recommissioned in August 1939. Now, 
Renown's technically reconstruct a recommissioned in August 1939. However, if war started, I think they could have probably chucked off another three months off that. So the Royal Navy and the British government does have the infrastructure they could have chucked about three months off that. So that could put it back to August, July, June, maybe May, May, June. She could have been available, so she wouldn't have been available immediately, but Renown, uh, probably she'd have been available early enough to get out there and cause some fun before the war ended. But, yes, and that's if, of course, Japan has trade going on, other than their own internal trade. But either way, in 1939, they'll be dealing with some very, very nasty tensions from the Royal Navy's battle cruiser squadron. Um, I, I, I doubt Courageous and Glorious would be with the battle cruisers. Uh, the Royal Navy doesn't have that many enough carriers to be deploying the battle cruisers, but I wouldn't be surprised if you had Ark Royal, Courageous and Glorious formed into a strike carrier squadron. I'm not sure whether they would get another carrier added in, and if they did, you probably get um, a carrier squadron which was loaded up with fighters for defense of the fleet and spotters. Uh, that would be centred on Eagle, Hermes, probably, uh, possibly Furious would be left in the home fleet, Atlantic fleet. She might well be, she might be taken out. But um, Courageous, Glorious and Arc Royal would be probably form a strike carrier squadron. So you would probably have, British would probably have five to six carriers out there. Um, yeah. These policies, though, believe it or not, do sometimes disagree completely. It's quite a, it, they are fun documents to read the English translations of the bits that are translated. Hmm, man. Um, Thomas Hammer. Oh, wait a minute. February 1951. Internet. The RN is just in the first series of experiments with airborne radar and radar on carriers. Very expendable, but war would have boosted development. Yeah, this is the point. The Royal Navy actually has radar on ships at this point, and they would have... Yes, it would have been pushed up. And again, how do I put this? The thing about war starting in the Far East is the Royal Navy isn't going to be competing for resources with the Royal Air Force or the Army. They're going to be seen as the it's a go, it, it, the Far East is considered the Navy's air ground. Yes, the RAF will want to get involved. Yes, the Army will get involved. Yes, da, 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 da. but resource wise, the Navy are going to take precedence. So unlike it's going to be very different from let's say the Battle of Britain scenario where the RAF basically went no Supermarine, you can't build a fighter for the Navy because we need to concentrate on Spitfires. The Royal Navy would go we are you, yes you need Spitfires to pretend if, in case of a war in Europe, but we will we need the sea fires for the Far East. And radar development would be a case of, well, yes, we know radars are important for chain home. We want you to keep in implementing that and do that. Yes, please to carry on. But, you know, uh, the Navy needs a lot of radar resources as well. And then you have the realities that the Royal Navy is going to, need to be doing the trade protection in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean. The fact that the Americans will probably get involved with supplies or anything just as early uh, or straight away. It, it, it's going to change things pretty much. How does the 25mm do against the swordfish? Well, if the swordfish is doing it's painted in night strike, it's probably the 25mm is not going to do that well. It'll be firing up here. If it hits, it'll probably go through. Hello, God's Trousers. So, what am I saying? Well, basically, I'm saying that if you want to actually have a military doctrine, for this operation, it's not the Kantai Kesen which will be the, uh, the driving of the Japanese doctrine. It'll be Yugeki Zenkin Sakusen. 
it will be interception attrition operations. This is what's in the dominance in the late 1930s. This is what Yonai, uh, Hirioso, and the others can all, uh, can all actually agree on. So this is what I expect the Japanese to be trying to follow policy of. The interesting option is what happens with the Philippines. Do they invade it or not? Do the Americans join the war or not? That's going to have a big, pol uh, big impact. But it's interesting. So I don't know, that was the point I was making. There's a different development you go for strategic radar versus tactical radar like you need for the RM. Um, and the point I was making was that basically because of the Battle of Britain, because of all the focus that happens with World War II, but when World War II begins, British radar is incredibly dominated by the development of strategic radar for chain home, etc. Whereas if it war starts in January 1959 in the Far East, it will be dominated by tactical radar. Andrew Cox, if French decide, the French decide to start joining, what do they send? Um, everything that's working. So. And yes, the Royal Navy probably do ask the French to assist in the Atlantic and Mediterranean, but to an extent, you probably get the older ships of the Royal Navy, the older ships of the French Navy, the older ships of the US Navy being the Atlantic vessels and the more modern and more powerful units going to the Far East. That's a couple of gas work. Um, I know the 25mm had vibration and reload issues, a somewhat anemic bursting charge, but I haven't heard its fuse problems. What's the plague going back to? No, it's just that the um, string bag was literally wire and canvas, so by the time the fuse realised it had hit something, it would be a long way, but a long way past swordfish. <laughs> it's not that the fuse has any issues, it's what the swordfish is actually made of. <laughs> Very thin canvas. <laughs> Hello, you gone? <laughs> if it actually, if the twenty-five millimeter actually managed to hit any of the airframe, it will probably go off. But seeing as the airframe is a very small percentage of the aircraft versus the actual um, content of the ship, um, I've just realised I'm down to this in Iron Brew. If you don't mind, I'll be back in a second. I'm going to grab some more. I think I'm going to need it. But um, yeah. back in a second with more Iron Brew. Apologies. Uh, right. Warning judges me too much. I do have extra iron brew stored in the uh, woodworking shed. When? Oh, what's that? Ah, yes. Uh, Benjamin Hector, do you think the Americans might join to uphold the balance of power introduced by naval treaties? I think the Americans would join, but we'll leave that to one. I will get into it in a long second. Um, here is a key point you have to remember. The Yamato class are not even launched till 1940, so they're not taking part. 
They are an interesting idea and doctrines. They are part of the Kantai Kesson because they are, of course, these decisive ships, theoretically. Uh, the Yugeki Sengen Sakusen, they're part of that because they're fast battleships which can provide a significant hitting power for striking enemy fle uh, fleets in the night action. Um, uh, Taiken Kyo Shugi, they are big ships with big guns. Um, but as I've said, despite the fact they fulfill all these different briefs, Yonai hates them because he doesn't seem as worthwhile. He sees them as a waste of infrastructure because the Japanese haven't got enough infrastructure to go around, and putting all your eggs into one but into these two these baskets doesn't help. Andrew goes, so we won't see the Bretang sitting in the Lion Nelsons? Dunkirk's could be an interesting addition to the Battle Cruiser, though. Dunkirk's I would see more likely than the Bretang's. The Bretang's I would see backing up the R's in being the presence in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. No. Knights of Garen, I have tried the Zero Sugar Iron Brew. It is, despo it is demonic. It is not Iron Brew. It is foul. It is not worthwhile. I limit myself to Iron Brew on Thursdays. Sundays and high holidays. That is how I'm dealing with a diet today. But also, I have to admit, I am having a fairly good diet today because going to my Fitbit, I've used five and a half thousand calories today because I went to the gym. So, in the nicest way, considering I only had chicken and veg for lunch, I can probably drink two, two liters of uh, four liters of iron brew and not worry about the calories. That is strategic thinking. Yes, I go to the gym first, and then I can just enjoy what I like. <clears throat> oh, great. Mm -hmm. That's all nice. I'm going to check the floor. Oh. This is the trouble with having foxes and dogs in your garden. Occasionally, you have some quite disgusting discoveries. Hmm. Oh right, well, I'll clean it up in a second. Don't think my sister cleared up the dog dirt again today. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, all right then. Hmm. Nice uh, Not every mission requires Hawaii to Japan and back non-stop. There are bombing missions that don't, uh, don't with targets much closer than you know. Yeah. Uh, hmm. We don't need an iron brew intervention. I enjoy iron brew. Ah, uh, da 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 da. Jack Ray, I thought of trying to die down as I'm a diabetic. Oh well, it's not the same. It's really not the same. 
There it was, it steps into a landmine. A Zebedee mine, I'm thinking. Hmm. The sharp angle, dogs, dog hair, and other things. I never blow. The shoes are left outside the office, though, now. It takes a lot to make me angry and blow up. It really does. I am, uh, as a rule, quite a mellow personality. <sighs> it does smell better now, though, that I've got every single bottle of brew open in here. So, as everybody mine. <clears throat> Right, let's get on with this. So, here is the interesting thing to think about with war in a war philosophy. This is Osami Nagano, who, as I've said, is a uh, from the pro-war faction of the Japanese Navy. He said, in according to the opinion, uh, um, according to in a basically a staff meeting, according to the opinion of the Japanese government, if Japan accepts the demand of the United demands of the United States, Japan will perish. However, if Japan fights against the United States, Japan may perish. That is, accepting the request of the United States will destroy Japan without fighting the United States. Even if we fight against the United States, if Japan cannot avoid the danger of extinction, if Japan defeats uh, the def uh, defeats without fight uh, without fighting Japanese in the United States, the Japanese people will truly disappear from the earth. Is defeated without fighting. However, if Japanese people can't fight, can fight, and sh show the spirit of defending Japan, even if Japan fights against America, our descendants will always rebuild Japan. We hope to solve the problem in diplomatic solution and negotiations, but unfortunately we will be fighting if we are to be commanded to wage war. He's not exactly the most straightforward thinker, and I'm fairly sure this loses something in its translation from Japanese to English. But I have the feeling that he is thinking... And the whole policy of Japan, if war happens, if war does break out, is that they have no chance of winning the war. I don't think there is anyone who really thinks in Japan they have much of a chance of winning a war against America, not in the Navy. Even the pro-war pro Navy Admiral doesn't really think that the Japanese have a chance of winning the war. And that's just against America. Against Britain and America combined, there's no chance. But the thing is, they're going to put up the best fight they can. And this makes them dangerous, because if you've got no chance of winning, but you're committed to fighting, then you're committed to fight, you're going to consider for options and operations, which no one else normally would do. Because if you're going to lose anyway, there's no point harboring forces. There's no point, you know you know, being protective of your forces. You can afford to be do high-risk operations. Now, the problem for the Japanese is ultimately the war faction which wins the war, or wins control and starts the war, are also inherently conservative in their use of ships. I mean, use of forces. So, they both at the same time push for a war, and at the same time try and preserve ships to fight a decisive battle. The interesting fact, uh, thing is that the faction which didn't want the war are at the same point less conservative in their use of ships. They're more likely to do high-risk operations. So, for example, Nagumo comes from the war faction, I would argue. He's very conservative in how he approaches his use of ships. Whereas Yamoto, Yonai, etc., the peace faction.
Yeah, the amateurs were rather stylish. You're totally incognito from the long run to the Allied War Pacific War effort. Yes. They believe, basically, Knights of Texture 1, that they will be destroyed as a nation. That their culture, heritage, will be destroyed. Colin Cameron, the, nation, uh, the translation sounds like a more complex version of Churchill's nations that go down fighting rise against speech. Pretty much. It does. And it is. So, here is the Singtel incident, and... I love using this as my opening point whenever discussing Singtel. This is the official write-up, and it sounds so nice. Atrus Birmingham was ordered to Singtel to investigate and to obtain the vessel's release. The Japanese Navy disclaimed responsibility for her arrest, and the Commissioner of Customs at Singtel stated that he did not wish to detain her. In view of those th these disclaimers, Captain Brind announced that he intended to sail the ship in company with Atrus Birmingham for Shanghai at 0800 hours on the 3rd of January, which he did after having placed an armed guard on board for the night of the 29th, 30th, to prevent any further interference with the ship. Here is the point. That sounds very nice and safe, but here's the thing. If it's so peaceful and so pleasant, why is Captain Brind putting an armed guard aboard the ship? If everything is being sorted out so politely and diplomatically, why is he putting an armed guard aboard a ship? Why is Edward Ashmore, whose book I have somewhere behind me called The Battle in the Breeze, um, being deployed to the ship with armed sailors? Why? Sounds awfully heavy duty for someone who's apparently not facing much. But that's what they did. Oh, I don't know. Sorry, just making sure to text my family and tell them what I need. Uh, what I need, and also where to avoid the uh, Zebedee mines. It's all found. Yes, the concept of a cultural war for your existence sounds awfully familiar here. Yep. Can't think where that's going on at the moment. That's uh, and um, the Soviets are more likely to destroy Japanese culture, not the US. Really? You're talking, uh, nine six eight one. your appreciation of the Japanese culture is different. In that, the Japanese culture is not like the American or the Russian culture. The Japanese culture is not a capitalist culture. It's still a very traditional culture. And yes, there's a $300 fine in 1939. Yeah. Uh, slap on the wrists. Oh, it's an ouch. But let's be honest, for an owner of a ship, that's not a lot of money. This is the owners on a ship. Uh, the owners of the system of fine of $300 is um, it's ouch if you're an individual person. If you're a ship owning a ship, you're a ship company, $300 is not a lot. Um, Today, $300 is the purchasing power of, um, equivalent to purchasing power of $6,123. 
according to inflation calculator. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of money for an individual. It's not a lot of money for a owner of a ship. That's what happens. But here is a slightly more um, realistic write-up. And this comes from, again, there's a link down below of... This is an article I wrote. And I've written it. It's on global maritime history. We, I'm moving all over the place. So, after, al after almost a day of tense diplomacy, that had commenced immediately upon, arri upon arrival of HMS Birmingham, with both her Captain Eric Brind and the Sing Tower Consul General, Mr. A.J. Martin, or Henry Hadley Derry, according to some, uh, some files. It's interesting, both names get used. I do sometimes wonder if the, gen if the uh, <clears throat> Consul General in Sing Tower is a fast-track civil servant rather than a regular one. These meetings uh, were heavy going and were apparently getting nowhere. Frustrated by the very senior officers, absent due to it being Sunday. Sorry. My uh, lovely people have arrived with um, stuff in the air freshener. Um, there is, well, there is stuff from Can you drop them off? Thank you. No. Hello, your minds. Yes, yours. You can come and apologise to people. <laughs> I might not like the smell. <laughs> you probably won't like the smell knowing you. Come in. I'm coming. I charge. <sighs> I came to apologise for the Zebedee Vines. And um, if they were on the path, they could be Raleigh Vines. There's Ebony Mines. I cleared up the Raleigh Mines. Hello. Hello, I'm in the Tafra. Right, let's make sure we can get rid of it. And, okay, do you want to read this or shall I? Well, almost as soon as he announced this, Captain Brin embarked a party. Oh, I missed the bit. Okay. You carry on, Papa. All right. Um, and being Sunday, and the moderately senior officers claiming no knowledge of why it had happened. So much so uh, that, in fact, when coupled with the incidents of Japanese interference with the boats, Captain Brind decided to force the issue. Therefore, he announced that the British ships would be leaving at 0900 hours on the, on the next day. Almost as soon as he announced this, Captain Brind ordered a party to go and secure the merchant ship. Whilst the night was spent, uh, was passed relatively peacefully, thanks in part to the gangway having been raised, first thing in the morning, there was an attempted boarding of the SS Vincent de Paul, but it was diplomatically resisted by an uh, by a RN party led by a 19-year-old midshipman, who basically pointed out he still had a, he had a gun on him, and future Admiral of the Fleet, Edward Ashmore, which had been stationed on board to deter uh, board earlier. In the morning, the ships all got on their engines are warmed up and ready as early as possible. Thanks, sis. Right. I mind. Take the shoes in as well. No, I'm not taking the shoes in. Oh, I was hoping you could put them in the dish on um, the washing machine. No, Thank you. No, no, I'll do it myself going, that one. They are. Right. In the morning, the ships got all on, got underway, the engines warmed up and are ready as early as possible, forming up with HMS Folkestone in the van and HMS Birmingham that are protecting the rear. What this had been going on in harbour, AJ Martin, the consul, had been having an absolute nightmare. After the previous day, he had gone back to the consulate, only to be woken up by a phone call from Mr. Yamoto, the head of the customer service in Singtao, 
who earlier today had claimed he had no interest in the assistant Vincent de Paul, Mishimoto had a question which went right to the heart of the issue. Rather than being at Heixiang Xing, as her papers cleared her for, the assistant Vincent de Paul had, along with Norwegians, been at Shenangru, as shown by photographs taken by aircraft, many miles apart. After midnight, there was no, uh, there was though no cho a choice of communicating with the ships. The concept didn't have a radio. Upon being told this, Mr. Yamoto responded that if the ship left before the matter was cleared up, it could be dangerous. Not exactly phraseology that would have reduced Mr. Martin's worries. Martin, in the true style of foreign office in China, calmly asked what the danger was. Whether the Japanese Navy would open fire upon British ships before waiting for an answer, he carried on to inform Mr. Yamoto that it would be Quite impossible for a telegram to reach Shanghai by 800 hours, so the Japanese authorities would be solely responsible for any consequences. 1930s diplomatic speak for, This situation is not going to end well if you are saying what I think you are saying, so why not think again, preferably quickly. This firm approach, echoing Captain Brin's stance earlier in announcing his, uh, his time for leaving, resulted in the head of customs stating he was merely a messenger, and then took his, uh, taking his, uh, took his leave only to return a few minutes later to inform Mr. Martin that he could send a letter out to H. Birmingham to, uh, by launch, stating he needed an answer um, on the Hisiang issue by the time they left, and also offering to take a letter for Mr. Martin along too. Uh, along too. Unsurprising, Mr. Yamoto was taken up on this offer, but the messenger, a junior customs officer, returned at 0130 hours on the 30th to say the Japanese Navy would not allow him to go into get onto the pier, let alone Aboard, aboard a launch, and uh, furthermore, his late arrival was owing to being having prevented taking a straight route by their sentries. What this illustrates is, despite being able to communicate, the Japanese were apparently unable to work together, as well as the British, who couldn't talk to each other, or perhaps weren't willing to do so. Either way, the scene was set for the late that morning. So it owed 100 hours. After starting his ships and withdrawing his party from the SS Vincent Ball, Captain Brind had his little convoy begin their move. During a passage out, Birmingham and HIMS uh, Ashigaru's squadron all had their guns trained on each other at full action stations. Brin went so far as to assign turrets to each of the Japanese ships, focusing on their bridges. That this incident passed off peacefully under such circumstances was a testimony to the strength of presence the RN had managed to mobilize regarding legacy personnel and vessels within the Far East, as well as the confidence uh, that their crews had to hold firm in the face of such overwhelming enemy strategies. Strength, strength. It's a fun thing to have written, I have to admit. It's one of those things which once you get, you know, sort of you go back and you read it and you go, nah, I wrote read that quite well. Which is always nice to do. So, oh. and this is the little sloop, HMS Folkestone. Right then, let me get the chat, get the chat up because I it disappeared for a few minutes there. Actually, would the RL Navy be in a much stronger position to face the Rage of Marina and Cooper in Europe? Going it broke out sometime down the line after one of our East. Yes. Vision, US destroyed Japanese culture before the war, baseball and Mickey Mouse. Occupation only finished them off. In return, we will buy Japanese estates. Hail Sony, God bless Toyota. Don't forget Subaru! Is anime Nagumu's revenge then, Constantine? Possibly. <laughs> there you there Who's the console in Tink Sinkal? The red guy from Challenge. Challenge. Hmm. <laughs> BCH, what a dogged YouTuber. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, now I've got an idea. Since Hitler was the, uh, what views the British as the enemy of Poland, most likely this would trigger a war in Europe faster too, like earlier version invasion of Poland and France? No. You see, there is a reason for that, and I'll get into it in a second.
Clan Arcana, why were the Norwegians involved? Because one of their merchant ships had been in the same place as the uh, SS Vincent de Paul. The Royal Navy got them out as well. Uh, the point I would like to make about this, and the divergence from history to actually cause this, is you have to remember that we are talking not in a range of thousands of yards, we are talking a range of hundreds of yards, and not even the high hundreds of yards. In fact, as I get into the Long Patrol, some of the Royal Navy, some documents I've read suggest that the Royal Navy torpedo officers aboard Birmingham thought they were too close for their torpedoes to arm before they hit anyone. Um, the, uh, the, the you're talking about point blank range. The actual interesting thing is the eight-inch shells might actually have passed through. HMS Birmingham, and then it would be the it would be another batch which would actually take her out on the first salvo. So she might actually get a couple of salvos off. The six inch shells would penetrate the armor on the Ashigaras at that point, and you would probably be dealing with if they if the Ashigaras fire, if the admiral decides it's an insult to Japan, this is horrendous. We are being insulted and fire their guns. Luckily, he turn he doesn't make that decision. He decides not to. But the fact that the guns followed them out there of all three cruisers follow the Birmingham out the whole way. It's pretty tense moment. You've got guns actually pointing at each other. This is something I try and explain to people occasionally because they're going, oh, it's always war was going to start in Europe first. And I go, "You the reason the Royal Navy doesn't think it's going to be Europe first is because you actually are pointing guns at each other in the Far East. You are pointing guns at each other. This is not... Not a normal diplomacy is normal. This is quite dangerous. And the odds are, if anything survives, it's probably Folkestone. And the reason I say that is the guns are all focused on Birmingham. Birmingham's guns are focused still on the other, other ships and probably sink. I would, I'm not going to say she sinks them, but I doubt any one of those Ashigara class would have a superstructure left. They'd all get blown to pieces. In terms of their superstructure. So none of them be usable for months. So in nice way, their mission killed. Folkestone probably is the only ship which gets away. I wouldn't be surprised if the Vincent de Paul gets smashed up as well. Folkestone will survive long enough to send off a radio broadcast. She might get further away and get home. She might not. I'm not sure. But she would survive long enough to get her radio message out. It's not a good scenario. It's basically one town class cruiser, one merchant cruiser, uh, well, not one merchant cruiser, one merchant ship, and one sloop. The Japanese three Ashigara class heavy cruisers, which, for those who aren't sure, are these pretties. Aren't they pretty? <laughs> It, the guns were trained, and they were loaded, and they were hot. I know the British ones were, and I have to presume the Japanese ones were, because otherwise, what's the point of pointing the guns at them? It's a very, very close scenario. It is a Mexican standoff um, equivalent, as Jonathan Barrow has pointed out. It is not a good scenario for anyone. And that's the, the point. And this is why it could. This is why it's legitimate to ask the question: What happens if war starts at this point? Because that is what we're looking at. It's a flip of a coin. And war starts in January 1939. So, what is going to happen? That is where we get into the question: What are the Japanese policy? Uh, Don't Scott. What would the, the modern equivalent be? Locking fire control radar target and keeping lock. Pretty much, yes. That premium, they just focus into our own. Total Japan. But, well, you have to please do note this ship carries a couple of four inch guns. Both were trained on the Japanese. Now, I have, whenever I've talked to those before, always said I don't think they would actually achieve anything. But I went back over the plans uh, of the harbour and working out the routes. And actually, I might have been wrong. At the ranges we're talking about, the four-inch guns might have actually caused some damage. Nothing to anything with armor. But 
I mean, some of the unarmored areas of those ships could actually get damaged by the four-inch shells. Admittedly, it's at that close range that I'm worried the six-inch shells from Birmingham might actually pass through the ship. I think what would happen with the six-inch shells is they would smash in and they'd be going at such force they wouldn't go off until they were quite far into the Ashigaras. It's that close. We're not talking point-blank naval ranges of a few thousand yards. We're talking... One of the cruisers, I think, was within 400 yards range of Birmingham. Hmm. It's an interesting tier one overpainting uh, in World of Warships terminology. Yeah, which doesn't often happen in reality, but um, yeah, this scenario could actually see it happen. Gosh, if the British government was so concerned about Japan, why did they pull their forces from Malaya? Because they were fighting a war in, in Europe. In the nicest way, you only have so many resources. And remember, they would draw the resources slowly from the Far East, as slowly as they can, to try and cover until the war emergency forces come online. Remember, Britain had been building the forces on an idea of war in 1942. They were not ready for war in Europe in 1939. They could deal with war in the Far East in 1939, but not war in Europe in 1939. If Admiral Lee was there, he would probably be sighting the guns on people's actual eyes. Right. So the British operational doctrine, what it's going to be, and let's consider this one. The British operational doctrine is not met a hard and fast scenario. The British do not have equivalents of War Plan Orange. They don't think that way because they have a problem. The Americans are very much focused on the war with Japan because that's their likely war. But remember, that's one of three potential major war scenarios the Royal Navy has to think about. And then it has the combinations of those war scenarios perhaps hanging together. So they have ideas of what to do with war versus Germany, war versus Italy, and war versus Japan. War versus Germany and Italy. War versus Germany and Japan. War versus Italy and Japan. War versus about all three is the worst case nightmare scenario. Uh, only trumped by war versus those three in USA somehow. So, this is the thing. They don't have a fixed doctrine, but they do have an idea. Their rough idea for war versus Japan is to first rush a fleet out to Singapore. The fleet of Singapore will block off Japan from getting into the Indian Ocean and into British trade. After they've built up supplies and resources in Singapore, then they move up. Now, they might move up to Hong Kong and recapture that. They might move up to Taiwan. That's also another option for consideration. They might move up to the Philippines if the Americans are on their side. From there, they would then move up to Wei Hai Wei. Now, before they make a move, they would first clear the sea. They would use their task forces, etc., to move and maneuver and clear the sea. While they're clearing the South China Sea to move their fleet up through it, they would have raiding groups based on town class cruisers and their various battle cruisers going around attacking Japanese trade. The idea was to destroy as much trade as possible. They would also have ambush points arranged with the T-class submarines to secure their routes and maneuver. So they would try and secure the South China Sea by basically using T-class submarines to war off its wall off its entrance and make anyone suffer trying to come through them. A salvo of 10 sort of torpedoes is going to cause a task group problems. That's the idea.
my second run from in nicest way who you 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 don't you have no idea on that question because does the battle of denmark strait even happen is hood even there hood will be in the far east by that point so in nicest way the ships available at denmark strait would be whatever accelerated version the kgvs was put in so it's because again if you have the get denmark if you have the war in the far east Whereas for the war starting in Europe and the war versus Germany, Britain stops capital, uh, pauses capital ship construction. And basically, Churchill's logic for that is we're facing a summer, uh, we're facing an enemy who focuses on submarines in the past. This is despite the fact that the Germans have barely any submarines in 1939. That is, the, that is Churchill's philosophy. And we need to focus on escorts. War versus Italy, yeah, that may or that possibly would have brought the same thing, but probably wouldn't have. War versus Japan is definitely we need carriers, we need capital ships, we need carriers, we need capital ships. Japan is considered a major navy, and they're going to react like a major navy. So you wouldn't have the capital ship pause, you wouldn't have the carrier pause. So those are coming. It is a very complicated thing to start thinking about what they would have done, but they would have been moving forward. The fleet that comes to the that comes to Singapore, okay, that is Captain Brind at the top, the guy who was in charge of HMS Birmingham. I thought you'd like a picture of him. Of course, that's Harwood at the bottom. Harwood would have a duty. He would be holding off the South Atlantic and possibly be moving out from the South Atlantic with his cruisers to come across the Pacific that way to reinforce Singapore coming from that direction. He would be replaced by Hawkins class. The odds are the Admiral who comes out is Cunningham to command the fleet. Percy Noble will be left as the theatre commander because that works in British doctrine. But you're probably going to send out someone like Cunningham to command the fleet. Some of you'll remember is ill at this point. Henderson is back is not that well. Eva, um, he dies later this year in 1939. So yeah, it's going to be Cunningham. He will probably bring with him the Queen Elizabeths he has that have been upgraded and are working. He will probably get with him, get reinforced quickly by whatever battle cruisers are available. So you'll probably see the first ships which will arrive in the Far East will be the carriers, um, HMS Glorious, probably forming up with what, uh, with the carrier from the China Station at Singapore, and the Queen Elizabeths and Nelson uh, and the battle cruisers. They will stay there until Nelson and Romney arrive. Nelson and Romney will arrive. Will the remaining of Queen Elizabeth probably maybe some R class, but it's doubtful. It's going to now depend on the R class appearance. Is going to depend on which allies going to involve, and this is where it gets complicated. So the Americans are going to have three factions who are all going to believe the British are going to win this war. You have the racists, aka the white supremacist faction, which is still strong in American politics at this point, and they are going to believe that America uh, that British will win this war because they are white. Then you're going to have the industrialists who are going to look at the industrial capacity of Britain versus the industrial capacity of Japan. They are going to look at the British Empire versus Japan. They're going to look at it and go, Britain's going to win this. And third off, you're going to have the navalists who all believe the largest navy wins. So they're going to believe Britain's going to win this. Now you then have a problem. You don't turn up to fight. You don't get a vote in how things are decided. And America will not want Britain to supplant its position in the Far East. The British are powerful enough. The Americans do not, especially as the British are going to start massively building up because of this war without needing to worry about treaties. So the odds are the Americans send a fleet to the Philippines as well to, and join in the war. Also, because here's the, how it would play in the press. <gasps> Dastardly Japanese blow up British cruiser protecting British sovereign trade. 
They a massacre, British light cruiser, destroyed, Birmingham, blown sky high, Birmingham, blasted by three Japanese cruisers, in cowardly attack in harbour, under flag of parley. You can imagine the various known versions of it. It would be tremendously massive. So, the fleet will get formed up. The odds are they secure the South China Sea first, and if the Americans, are the, the plan is to then move up to the Philippines, the British fleet joining up the American fleet, probably Cunningham in charge, and a nice uh, American admiral as his second in charge. Uh, is all, as the British are the wounded party, probably supplying the majority of the ships, because as I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, in 1939, whilst the Americans and British are titularly equal in numbers, the uh, in equal in terms of treaty, in actual numbers, the G Congress hasn't built as many as the British have, and therefore the British problem, uh, the British have superiority in numbers, and the British are the agreed party, so the British will be the command in chief. You probably also get some French ships and Dutch ships joining in. Things like the Dunkirks, quite possibly, and various du uh, Dutch light cruisers. Now, here is the problem for America, for Germany and Italy. The world has just united into this alliance against Japan, who are the wrong party. If they don't join the war, they look like they, uh, they A, look weak, because they are basically saying they can't deploy ships out there. But also, there's a very real risk that this alliance is very, becomes very strong. So they either have to join the war, or if they decide to sit neutral, or as you've all pointed out, they could of course attack in Europe as they're doing. But there's a trouble with attacking in Europe. There's one thing attacking when you think you can divide your opponents. When they're already united and fighting and already on high alert because they're fighting and high mobilization, you're in trouble. If you're dealing with looking at an alliance, if you're Germany, looking at an alliance of America, Britain, France, Netherlands, and all the British Empire, that looks scary. But also, it looks like an opportunity. You can join it and show how powerful you're on the stage. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Shan horse, I don't think there's anything else the Germans have that would actually be of any interest to the British and the Americans, end up going out there into the Far, into the far East to take part. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Italians send some ships as well. Some of their modern, more modern ships get sent out. Which can lead to all sorts of interesting things for a European war further down the road. But that's the thing. That would be a, it would be a case of you either join it and look powerful and capable, or you don't join it and you look weak. Or possibly siding with the Japanese. You, it, it, it's a catch-22 for them. I'm getting into that now. I'm talking through that now. So I said um, on the, the hypothetical that's come, the curious bases the RN deploys from, etc. Now, the RN plans are basically, without American Philippines, they would go Singapore, Hong Kong, Ty poss uh, possibly Taiwan, and then Wei Hai Wei, where they would operate the blockade from. If they have the Philippines, they possibly skip this point and go to Wei Highway, but they probably still go for the Ta for Taiwan because it's Japanese territory at this point. Now their plan for Taiwan is always not to fight for the whole island, but to decimate use uh, use the fleet to attack various points around the island, uh, cut it off, and then land troops to secure sections of it using armor and infantry. This is the point to which they're going to do. Um, the British finances will hold out. Here is the reason for this. This is British, uh, the British route, of course, and various, uh, the British Empire.
But think about where the British trade is. Uh, you know, I've shown trade maps in the past. I, ha I could have, should have probably had one up here now. But British trade is thick in the Atlantic. British trade is in the ocean. If you stop the Japanese interfecting in trade, then basically Britain is fighting a war with a, pe with a peacetime trade economy. So they're on full war mobilization with peacetime levels of trade and commerce. That basically means they can fight a war as long as they want. This is not like fighting Germany or Italy. They've not lost the Mediterranean. They've not lost the Atlantic. And from the get-go, the Americans are in on their side. The Americans are allies. So from the get-go, you have burden sharing going on. Because as I said, the Americans can't afford not to be part of it. Um... MC Legend 38, if the RN is more capital ship focused in this scenario, would at least some of the land class battleships be actually completed? Yes. That's cool. The international relations are always about power. The US would never allow the UK to be only superpower in the negotiation tables of those peace talks. Exactly. So they have to join. Um, Vision, the war would become a war over China. So with big China lobbying the USA, pushing USA to punish Japan for its invasion, There'd be a good public mor a moral case for war uh, based on saving China. Oh, uh, yes, that would definitely also be involved. Um, Bidron, China is what drove the US and Japan to war in 1941, so war in 1941 is not far-fetched. It's forgotten in the USA that the war started because of US sanctions on Japan over China. Hmm. Deutschland class for use of covering lines of communication? Perhaps. Perhaps. And of course, with the pan able sunk. In UAD, I have trouble sinking the graph speed. Really? Hitler and Mussolini were joined to make themselves appear strong. Pretty much. In which case, this rules out war in Europe, I think, till 1942. Because I don't see a war with Japan lasting past the end of 1941. And they could, as Dirk's got to point out, could they, the Germans might get the Pacific Islands they lost in World War I back. Uh, I doubt it, though. I think the British would take them for themselves, but leave that to one side. Or make them mm, protectorates. <laughs> and the Soviets might join. They are, after all, at war with the Japanese in 1939. Yes, the Soviets could become involved. It could become a very interesting conflict for the Japanese to fight. So, what? how would quickly would they mobilise? This is the point. If this happens, the Japanese haven't had a uh, chance to mobilise pre it happening. So the Japanese have to mobilize and the Japanese have to deploy. The question is, if they think the Americans are going to get involved anyway, then I think they go straight for the Philippines. That's the, the safest thing the Japanese have. The only chance they have of really being able to influence the South China Sea contest is if they go for the Philippines. I'm not sure if Yonai pushes for that, though. I think Yonai might go, well, the Philippines are already off. Let's go for an attrition battle. Let's go for this kind of conflict where they're coming in. But I think Kiryoso will want to go to the Philippines. So I think there will still be a Japanese invasion of the Philippines. And I think that's the quickest thing they can get to. I don't think they can get really anywhere else. I can't see them getting to Singapore. The, the reason I have for this is the reason they can go to Singapore is they've already got Vietnam or Indochina at the point, French Indochina. So they can support an attack on Singapore from there at the same time as they're supporting a strike on the Philippines. They don't have that advantage in 1939. In 1939, they have to get there. They're also going to be attacking Wei Hai Wei, but the British are probably going to evacuate that, and they're probably going to go for Hong Kong. But again, that's going to be more complicated because going for Hong Kong when potentially the in 1939, when you've had two less years of beating up the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese government and the nationalist army, might well mean the Chinese nationalists are a factor in your attack on Hong Kong. This is not a good time to go to war with the British in 1939. Colin Cameron, a war in Europe in 1942 means vanguard and lion operational. Yes. Uh, nothing know. When seeing Japan, why am I seeing a nice young... <laughs> I have no idea what you, was, uh, you, 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 you are seeing that on there, uh, Senator Nero. Um, Nathan 
Manorans, Vanguard could not be as we know her. Assuming she's built as a rush, she'd probably look more like a lion or scared up to AGB. No, Vanguard would have still looked like Vanguard, because Vanguard design was being run along so uh, sides of KGBs anyway before that. The Vanguard design had been there to make use of the spare 15-inch turrets the, uh, the Royal Navy had. So, yes. Uh, I would argue the R-Class would be gone by the time this war was over in 1942, but I doubt the Queen Lizards would be all gone. They'd be gone as they were replaced by King jo by Lion-Class. KGVs were going to replace the R's, Lions were going to replace the QE QE's. So anyway, a meme. Hmm. That's an interesting meme. To be honest, uh, the Royal Navy post this war would not be a good combination for the Amer uh, for the Germans or the Italians to take on. But again, the Germans and Italians would have an experience of watching carriers in action. They would have an experience of watching Madeleine battleships in action. The thing is, though, they couldn't. Their production was already locked in on the Bismarck, etc. So there's only so much they could do unless they did an Admiral class on them. So they have problems. They're not going to be able to factor in those results, those and that and gain knowledge till post their next generation of ships. The Japanese plan, therefore, is probably going to be going to the Philippines. Um, I think on the balance, maybe go for some of the islands, but on the Philippines, they're not going to launch any strike on Pearl Harbor. There's no point. There's no fleet there. And basically secure an initial outer perimeter to support the aircraft, the land based aircraft. They have to try and offset the fleets coming for them. Cameron, one Vanguard a year as planned gives you three to four hulls under construction by 1942. Yep, or in service. So, here is one thing I want to make quite clear. The Kido Bataille doesn't exist. And I know I've said this earlier, but it really doesn't. Um, Akagi, Kaga, Soryo, Hiyosho, and Ryujo, most of these are in various versions of Refit, but they are theoretically available to be called on out of Refit in 1939. However, Hiryo is commissioning in July 1939. Zuho commissions in December 1940. Shokaku is launched in June 1939. And Zukaku is launched in November 1939. I, those two ships are probably not going to be available till 1940 at best, even if you put a rush on it. And remember, here is the thing. British infrastructure, I can talk about putting a rush on it. I cannot talk about Japanese infrastructure putting a rush on it. Because if we go back to <clears throat> a certain gentleman... The Japanese do not have the infrastructure in place to do a rush building program. Because, as he points out, instead of them doing the stuff which could allow them to build some battleships and infrastructure, they built... Mm -mm. He would have liked them to build slightly smaller, just as fast, probably not 18-inch gun, 16-inch gun battleships, which would require a lot less inf a lot less expenditure, development, and cost. And in return, he would have used the spare money to improve their infrastructure. And he certainly wouldn't have been trying to build four of them. Andrew Cox, Germany hasn't got the capacity to start their next generation ship until Bismarck and Turbots are out, so they won't be there until by 1942. Nope, they won't be. Malaga, I see the Bismarck of this scenario being fitted with a lot more air defences. I see the Bismarck of this scenario finding itself facing off against a lion class at the Denmark Straits and going, Ouch! I'm sorry. And also, you have to remember, the moment a war like this happens, 
the whole treaty system limitation on numbers of ships doesn't take place. Uh, you know, war doesn't count. So the R, uh, the British probably do still get rid of the R class, but the Queen Elizabeths are probably all updated in service. The KGVs are in service. The Lions are in service by 1942. And whatever's coming after the Lions is probably under construction. And oh, about three to four vanguards as well. Oh, and Nelson and Romney and probably Hood and Renown. Maybe even Repulse has been upgraded in this scenario because she'd been very useful in Japan in a war versus Japan. So you could be dealing with, let's see, that's five plus five KGVs. Um, plus five Queens, that's 15. Uh, plus five or so Lions, maybe, that's 20. And four or so Vanguards, maybe. So the Royal Navy could be on 24 capital ships by 1942. Because again, you have the war mobilization of the fleet and the fleet getting resources. Con Cameron, if you're looking at war with Japan, would we see an increase in capacity of the Indian Yards if it just to produce more ships to the destroyer size? Yes. Um, it's just, it's going to be a lot of ships. And there's a reason you need that many ships if you're fighting a war against Japan. But they, you're not going to get rid of them that quickly after the war's over. Macron Instructions. Do you suppose in this scenario lessons about mass airstrikes are learned, assuming the Americans aren't on station um, for the first major battles? Implications? Uh, that is going to be an interesting thing. Also, it could be some lessons in terms of the Anglo-American Joint Carrier Task Force could be quite an interesting learning experience for both sides. I wouldn't be surprised if you see something by 1942 if you've got something Midway Malta-like being built for both sides and both nations. Again, that will be interesting on it, on the Mediterranean War because if you have, you know, if you have them, what are you going to do with them? Uh, you get more free, more vanguards. What would you name them? I can answer that one. Uh, my vanguards will be named Victorious, Vigilant, and Vengeance. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> there is a vanguard class of four ships which are SSPNs. <laughs> Those names are capital ship names. That'll tell you exactly what you need. What's being is going to be named. Ah. Oh. Andrew Cox, does the RN get to Copenhagen, the IJN in Tokyo Bay, to warn the Italians of Toronto? Possibly, but even then, the Italians might decide the Toronto is still safe. Remember, they believe it's safe because of the shallowness of the harbour. It'll be interesting to see what would happen. And I can't predict how the ending of the war would go, because in I can predict how the war would end in terms of the Japanese would lose. I can't predict the actual course of the war, whether there's a battle, a battle the Japanese, etc., in harbour. Because it depends. So the Japanese decide to try and fight a decisive battle. Do they run out of fuel? Again, think about this from a scenario of the British. The British will be taking movings forward slowly. So they will build up at Singapore. That'll probably be about two months building up at Singapore. Then they'll surge up to the Philippines. Especially if they have to retake the Philippines, that's not going to be a quick operation. That's going to be the work of another two months. So that's four months. Then they're rebuilding up there. So that's six months into the war. And that's Japanese not getting any fuel supplies for those six months. Then they move up to Taiwan uh, while expending fuel on operations. Then they're going to move up to maybe Taiwan, maybe Wei Highway, possibly Shanghai. And then from there, they're going to move up to start putting in the blockade on Japan. So each point you're looking at about two months gap between the sort of implementing operations. So you're talking it's going to be, war's going to have been going on for 10 months with no fuel getting to Japan by the time they get into the Japanese fleet operations area. There's also going to be a point that the Japanese are going to be dealing with surface raiders for all that point, 
running around causing them trouble, which is going to burn up their fuel because they're either having to hunt down the surface raiders or convoys for groups to try and protect them. Also, submarines are going to be involved. So all these things are going to be attriting the submarine the Japanese forces. The Japanese will be trying to attrit the British, the British will be trying to attrit them, and etc. the Allies. This is, I, I put the war as two years because I think that's how long it takes to sort of starve Japan into agreeing a peace. Because again, there are going to be people who didn't want war in the first place. Again, actually, in charge. I don't think you end up with the same kind of mass bombing campaign, but you might do. In which case, you might end up with the British and Americans sharing a lot of their development technology, which they probably wouldn't share with the Italians and the Germans. I could see them not doing that. Uh, to develop some long-range strike bombers. But it would be interesting to see what kind of losses. Um, now, interesting, message what kind of losses the Iron Tanks have already against Japan? For use against Japan, Italy and Japan, it's very night to afford to do war. That's an interesting scenario. If you actually end up fighting a battle fleet on battlefield action, you're probably going to take a lot more losses. But the British, I don't see doing that sort of scenario. The British will be trying to drop, push the Japanese back. Remember, the Japanese are trying to do an attrition war, but their submarines are going to be facing Azdik, which is probably going to... What's the interesting thing is the Japanese fewer submarines involved are probably going to teach the British the problems of Azdik, and the British are going to develop the solutions, i.e. the squid morpher, etc., to field the, the Japanese submarines, which is going to mean the British anti-submarine forces are going to be a lot stronger by 1942. They will probably lose some ships to it. How many ships will they lose? Well, this becomes an interesting case, because... If you're moving up through the South China Sea, you're probably going to lose some ships. Will you? Uh, the Japanese submarines, etc., are supposed to target carriers. They do, they they like to target carriers first. So I would say the ships which I'm going to be most worried about losing are going to be courageous, glorious, Ark Royal to an extent, but less so her because he's probably moving faster. They're going to be zigzagging though. So ships are going to be lost. How many? It's hard to say. And the reason it's hard to say is because you are looking at a Japanese force, which is not the same you're fighting in World War II, and it all depends on where you, whether you have this big battle. The British are going to be trying to avoid the big battle. They're going to be trying to win by restricting the Japanese fuel supplies. That's the British uh, the focus. It's not going to, the British focus is not going to be on fighting a battle with Japan. It's going to be winning the war without having to fight a battle. Japan's going to be strangled. It's not going to be beaten to the submission. It's going to be strangled into submission. So there, the British plan, idea will be the uh, aim will be to try and fight a war where the J uh, Japanese never have enough fuel to actually use their ships for any fighting. And you have to remember, Japan for a lot of World War One or Two operations depends on fuel they capture off the British at Singapore. So a lot of their operations depend on the fuel they capture at Singapore. If they don't capture Singapore, if they don't have the Dutch East Indies and supplying oil, they're going to run out of oil quite quickly. So if the British take their time, which the British will probably be doing, even though the Americans will be chomping at the bit, the British will probably be taking their time. The, by the time the British get to Japan, Japan might not have enough fuel to fight a fleet battle. Or they might try and fight a fleet battle, but they'll have limited maneuvering. So that's their plan. You know, so imagine, if Yamagata's were built in this scenario, then post-war the RN might even have a Lion-class successor. Well, you know, the I, the Yamotos aren't even launched in 1940. But the interesting thing is, the Americans and the British probably come across them when they're dealing with at the end of the Japan of the war with Japan. They probably find out about them, and well, they already knew sort of they're coming. But they don't, the British thought they had 17-inch guns, not 18-inch guns. Studying them. Uh, probably means that the Lion class successors are going to be 18 inch battleships, 18 inch gunships. Again, if those are in service before World War II breaks out in Europe, before the European theatre of war start, breaks out, then that's going to be a big problem for the Germans and the Italians. Um, um, Doc, it's in Victorious Carrier. Well, Victorious was a carrier, wasn't it? Actually, by this point, she was all. Mm, Victorious when she lay down. She she is laid down before then, and I think she's named. So, uh, 
Let me just check. Mm, she's laid down in 1937, so yeah. Commissioned in 1941, launched in September 1939. Mm -hmm. Cute. Uh, so yeah, there was another name which was put up, which was quite good, which was um, which is another historic one, Vindictive. So maybe probably HMS Vindictive would be the thought. Would be the thought, or not victorious. So the war against the war against the, uh, the probably the British. The uh, thing they'll lose most of will be cruisers. I honestly think. The things that they will lose most of will be the cruisers, the British. Uh, I don't think they'll suffer much battle fleet losses. If they do, they'll probably be to air attack, um, which will then focus, re refocus, and re uh, uh, the British armament. The whole scenario will be predicated on fighting uh, the strategic war rather than fighting a tactical war. Um, Senec Nero, probably technically the vanguard, but the Jean Bart is the last completed. Um, MC Lincoln, what would the Lion class success look like? Probably like an enlarged Lion class with 18 inch guns at this point. Come, given the subs originally intended for the Pacific would not have been withdrawn to the Med and attacking the fleet, the other fleet would be seen as uh, would we see an increase in Japanese to the Japanese ASW efforts? The Japan doesn't have the infrastructure. The trouble is, as this gentleman, Yonai, pointed out so many times, Japan didn't have the infrastructure to increase their... They didn't have... Especially when they're building the amount of... The, they couldn't build the ships. They didn't have the infrastructure to build enough of these ships while they were building concentrating on those huge battleships. They didn't have the infrastructure to build more infrastructure when they were building those huge battleships. This is the li big limitation put on them. This is why he doesn't want them. And this is the point. This is what he says in 8th of August 1939. At the Five Ministry Commission, that was intended to make a plan for potential war, supposedly Minister of Finance, Sotaro Ishiwata, who was has no English wiki page, so very limited knowledge about him, um, because usually I use the English wiki pages as a starting point for going to find my research by going down to their... Inter uh, when I'm talking about specific people from foreign countries, I look, go down, look at their sources, and I go uh, the source of the wiki page. I go to those sort of those uh, those sources. I then look at their sources, and I follow that trail back, especially into journal articles. Um, asked Yonai, the minister, is it possible for the Imperial Japanese Navy to triumph over American Britain? Yonai answered, No, the Imperial Japanese Navy is not designed to open fire against them. The Third Reich and the Italian Navy are out of the question. Quite honest, it, 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 he doesn't believe they they have it. It would not be an easy war, but it would also be a very different war. Remember, in 1941, Japan has the has the advantage that everything's been withdrawn to fight a war in Europe, and there is nothing left in the stable. In 1939, January 1939, they'd be dealing with everything. And as said earlier, the Germans and Italians, rather than attacking, would probably be joining in with the Allies. In which case, you would be dealing with a far larger armada. And then that adds something. Because if you have the um, the uh, Nishanos and Nice now operating with Repulse and Hood as ships hunting down Japanese merchant vessels, that's going to be something. That's them occupied. It's. Mm, it would be a very different war. Donagama, so what you're saying is the British listen to Clausewitz. They listen to Corbett, who basically listened to Clausewitz and turned it into something pra very practical for the British. In winter, would the British also crash build more Arc Royal class? No, they're already building the Illustrious class. So, as I said, they probably build larger versions, and it would probably be something close to the Midway or the Audaciouses would be in mass production by 1942. 
Andrew Cox, do you think the UK could have an 18-inch mount design and debunked by Nerf 42? Um, you're talking about a nation which has been flirting with an 18-inch gun since 1909-08. Yes, I'm fairly certain the British could. Remember the British actually did have 18-inch guns in World War One. Yes, they were not really battleship guns in, in the version that they were, produ they were actually putting the service in. But um, yeah... I think they could. I think they had a scalable turret worked out for it. A twin, it'd be a twin eighteen-inch gun turret, but it would be a turret, and they could have. They would probably have eight, like eight gun design, maybe a treble gun design, and go for a treble turret design, and go for nine eighteen-inch guns. This one, you given the RM would expect everyone else to get to go to eighteen-inch guns after everyone else became known design. The RM never could not go for twenty-inch guns. Have the bigger guns. It depends on how much resources they're going to get from British government. Remember, they're having to compete for resources. In, if next war is likely to be a European war because the Japanese are out of it, then the odds are everyone's looking at the uh, the Royal Navy's going, well, yeah, we've got our resources now, but uh, yeah, the next one is on the RAF and the Army. MC Engine, maybe they'd have 9 18-inch guns, but probably the Americans would still focus on the 16-inch guns because that was their plan and 12 16 inch and versus 9 18 inch it does match in that's right so if the british know about the owners do they build the 100,000 on super lines and 18 inch guns Mm, possibly. They built something with 18-inch guns. It probably is an evolution of the King George V and Lions. It probably is, because, you see, that's the design train. The quickest design train the British will have is to scale up the 16-inch turret to support an 18-inch gun, and scale up the Lion design to support 18-inch guns, because that's going to produce your be your quickest avenue to producing a ship, to scale up what you, exist, you have already. Government, and you would probably get multiple HS unicorns giving they are fighting Pacific along supply chain. Oh, yes, there would probably be a lot of those ordered. But overall, this is not a good war for the Japanese. This is not a good war for anyone to fight. If it happens, the Japanese doctrine will undoubtedly be an attrition strategy. If Yonai is given full reign, I have no doubt that they would harbour their resources until the Allies got close and then try with the air power and everything they have from the home islands to use that to attack the um, Allies. I The interesting thing is you wouldn't have had the years of war which lead to the um, Toku attack, uh, to Doctrine, the suicide planes. So, if you don't have them and the suicide aircraft, you don't have kamikazes. So, you would have probably a more conventional fight, but I would argue that would actually be more dangerous. You would also have the fact that the Japanese would not have had the attrition on their personnel like you have in World War II. So, by the time you get to the home fleets, you are going to still be dealing with the veterans of Japan, the, be the, the creme de la creme. It's not going to be long enough to have the issues of tr replacement. It's going to be a big and massy, a massive and bloody battle. And that's where the British are going to lose ships and the Americans are going to lose ships. And they're probably going to lose them to air attacks. Now, my theory again is cruisers will be the ones which will suffer. The reason I think the cruisers will suffer is because when you're attacking from above, a cruiser looks like a battleship. And if you're attacking from above, that's what they're going to be focusing on. Snow cruisers, where's Bill Trumps? Bill Trumps is coming. Um, I'm sorry, I've, I, I did explain to a couple of people on in direct messages what's happened. We've had there's been something at university which has taken my time this week. So Bill Trumps will be coming out tomorrow rather than it's recorded. It's all done. I just haven't had the time to put it up because I've been dealing with things at university. Uh, we've had some issues.
Oh, Scott, I imagine that whether the Montanas had 1216 or 918 depends on whether the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Ordnance messed up us in our timeline and ended up with the fantastic uh, 16, uh, 1650s. If they didn't, probably 18s. It'll be an interesting case. Nantrim, the good news of Japanese is the British will lay the alliance will want to negotiate a surrender. True. Um... They may do, but um, they might do with Victorious, but I doubt they would rename actually a carrier, which is on the, on the construction at that point. Because there's the fact that the they're all the Urius designs. They're illustrious, Victorious. This is formidable. So that's already, that's already an Abel. Hmm. Anything interesting? Ultimately, this is a, there is a reason why Japan backs out Tsingtao, because honestly, their Kai command does realize this is what happens. And there's a reason they backed down in January 1940, when you've got the Asamamaro incident. Because they realize this could happen. It's not till 1941 they feel confident enough to do this, and they feel they have to do this. Because it's 1941 by the time the sanctions really start to bite, and it's 1941... By which time the British are really withdrawn from the Far East. They have drawn down their forces as much as they can do. And they're starting actually to rebuild them. This is the point. In 1941, the British are starting to look at rebuilding their forces. And the Japanese know that. So they know there's a window in which they can operate. A window in which they can do it. So... Well, first question goes, Dan Freeman, has this been what you were looking forward to when you, uh, you know, suggested this on Patreon? I hope I've answered the question. I hope I've delivered on it. As said, there is going to be a long patrol which comes out on Saturday. So I hope that's a good one. Oh, I doubt it'll be HMS Vasilate. Ooh. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, where's the question that's gone? Oh, there's a question. Um, yes, the Bruni, thank you. That's good. Thank you, Dan. Glad this would be good. No, a negotiation, as the Japanese expected the Americans to agree to. And the British would be quite happy with a negotiated thing on surrender from Japan. Probably the British requirements would be withdrawal from South Korea, or withdrawal from Korea. Which could be interesting, because it depends on which troops occupy Korea. If the Soviet Union occupies Korea, then we have an entirely communist South Korea. Korea. If, however, British and American troops occupy Korea, which might happen, you could end up with a unified Korea which is Western-leaning. Um, China, well, that would be different, because, again... In this scenario, you would get the nationalist forces wouldn't have been hollowed out as much as they were by the next few years of war. So they would be trading, would be part, and probably integrated into the alliance. So in which case, they get a lot more resources, they get a lot more supplies. It, interesting enough, it might lead to not a communist China. It might lead to it. Probably possibly still good, but it might not lead to one. Um, as for nukes, well, they're not developed probably in this war, but they will be starting to work on them. The question is whether they actually end up getting used first in the European war, and who uses them first. Nukes are still going to get developed, but it's where they're used and who develops them first. Um, and again, it buys more time for Poland to rearm. It buys more time for 
all sorts of countries to strengthen their defences in Europe, which could change the whole European war. France could realise its problems with its command and control systems uh, and actually reform and change them between 1939 and 1942. Uh, the Norwegians might even step up their defences. There might be a change in it, especially if they see the world arming and getting more, uh, getting more armed and fighting and etc. They, they're going to change their defences. So you could end up with a very big change in the world before 1942 happens. There are still questions going on, Anouk. Don't worry. So, questions? Baron, the US started the Manhattan Project out of fear of war with Germany, not Japan. The US still very much gets bombed by 1945. And it's the same with the British. They have their own project going on. So I wouldn't be surprised if the British have the war bomb by 1945. Or at least I'll make, maybe 1946. I, I think both sides might be slowed down by the lack of war, oh, war but they might not. That's what I thought the research on the fundamentals and were already funded on the way by 39. Pretty much. They're starting work. And that's nice. It's hearing reported out. Uh, their nuclear ground slam bombs. That wouldn't surprise me with the British, but also the idea, the, uh, the odds are Lancaster, which has been developed with Pacific War experience, is going to be very different. My name was, how do you feel, sorry, name my name question to turn the chat, sound chat and something silly. No, I didn't. It was an interesting one. Uh, how do you think heavy bombers come into play? That's going to be an interesting one. The heavy bombers in 1939, especially the British ones, do not have the range to attack Japan until you get a lot closer to Japan. So they'll be needing a lot of work on them. And the thing is, I have a feeling they would actually be finally developing them in service probably by the time the war's over. So the war with the, the the heavy bombers wouldn't get the be the same as they were, but I think the heavy bombers that would then conversely have an effect on the European war, war because imagine if you have the baseline for your British bombers, especially in a European war, are built on Pacific theater ranges. If the those have been built to Pacific theater ranges, then they're going to be very long range bombers, and suddenly German oil fields, etc which are out of range would be very much within range. Then ambition. The Manhattan Project was a joint US UK Canada project to the US decided it wasn't. Mm-hmm. But in many ways that's a product of World War Two, of post nineteen forty one, it becomes a joint project. There are British and American and, uh, and British and American projects going on before that. That's what. How does China play into the war with Japan? They get massive amount of resources chucked their way, and they will probably tie down a large number of Japanese soldiers. Much they did unrealistically. I don't know, would this war likely mean something akin to the Battle of Daring Class is coming in earlier, uh, with the lessons presumably learned from the uh, uh, from AA action? Yes. I have no doubt that the something probably like the Daring Classes, which are far similar to the L70 design, would be in service quite a lot quicker. I think, yeah, if the British have nukes, does the Hitler even start, start their start of war in Europe? Hitler probably tries to pursue a nuclear program as well. That's the reality. If the British have nukes, then Hitler's going to try and see nukes.
Listen, given how World War II went, it's hard for me to see how Japan goes for negotiated peace easily. The Japanese army might still pin hopes on defeating invasion to get a favorable peace. They might do, but the reality is they'll have no fuel and supplies. And again, you're dealing with the British. It's going to sound strange, but they are going to be going around hassling Japan. And they might well be firebombing Japan as it is. But shelling and generally demoralizing, attacking Japan before they, you know, and offering them the surrender, terms of surrender. There's also the point is this. In nineteen uh, before nineteen in nineteen thirty nine, you still have his party in in seniority. If I point this out, if we go back to this thing, right. he is prime minister January nineteen forty to July nineteen forty. He is minister of the navy for um, until August nineteen thirty nine. So. There is a difference in the atmosphere in Japan at this point. Yes, they're fighting war, but you have, still have, you have in many ways, at the end of World War II, you have the very hardliners in power. Whereas you'd have had the, not, not saying they're not hardline in terms of, they're the ones who are going to see a diplomatic solution. And a negotiated peace with the British would allow Japan to stay Japan. It just wouldn't be allowed an empire, whereas a fighting a battle to the end in Japan would destroy Japan. And that would be the point. It would be a peace as long as they could negotiate a way for Japan to stay as Japan, but without the empire. Death Squad, I was wondering more if Britain could use an airfield base in, uh, base in China to hit Japan and Lancaster. Go away and do a range maps with the Lancaster bomber. You might find it would be interesting to high and hit or try and hit Japan from German, uh, from China, especially trying to hit anything in Japan which is worthwhile hitting from uh, with a Lancaster bomber. It would have to be more a Manchester, I think it is. It's a Manchester bomber, I think, which is the longer range version of Lancaster. Andrew Cox, not to mention the Pacific developed bombers will be perfect for closing the Mid-Atlantic Gap from day one. Yes, but there again, the horde of uni HMS unicorns would also probably help with that. I was asking, don't think three more years of Rearm would massively help Poland. We would still be in an unfavorable geostrategic situation, almost completely surrounded. True. But three years of rearmament would mean that the scenario would still would be slightly different vis-a-vis -vis perhaps Polish should get involved and send some things to help out the Allies. If the Polish are built into the alliance system with the Americans and the British, then uh, it becomes a different scenario. If, Amer if Germany thinks that America and Britain will automatically go to war on behalf of Poland, then it becomes a case of what's our benefit. Jeff Barnett, if Germany and Italy against uh, J uh, Japan, we actually get some Axis ship on Axis ship action, like Bismarck versus Nagata. Uh, Bismarck's unlikely to be in service before the Bull War is over. Um, Taiko versus Zara? Mm, maybe. Draft 7 and Grilla? Mm, doubt they would be involved. They would actually be completed in time. And uh, the, the problem is, again, Germany has the infrastructure issue. They can't. The Germans can't rapidly build, speed up their construction. It's the, the the universal problem across all the Axis sides is the they have no spare capacity in their maritime infrastructure to speed up and accelerate production. The British, if you consider this, and this is the example I tend to give, the Americans grow their infrastructure to be able to speed up production. They massively grow it. The British have quite a large sustainable infrastructure, so they shift it. They go, we're producing escorts. And then when they go, hang on, we actually need to produce another battleship, we need to produce more carriers, they shift. And the resources flow in, and then suddenly going from a dead stop, they're going to worked up and going to start, and then they start churning them out. And they churn out the light fleet carriers and various other things from almost a dead stop to a start, uh, to a start because they have the infrastructure to move around. The Germans, the Italians, the Japanese don't have that. Um... 
Zoski, I guess the question would be whether even nasty dictator, even side the polls and open eye, want to risk engaging alliances to forge in a war that are guaranteed that are guaranteed Poland in 1942. That's the question. And I think it would be after 1942, any war in Europe after this. I think it'd be after the war's been over for about a year to two years. I know productions. What would the Creative Marines approach to Europe production be designed be? Uh, do we get Type 22 and build up a mass production for a uh, mass prior to European war? I think possibly because they would basically they would continue experimenting in iterative design improvements. So instead of mass production switching over to mass production, they would keep building improved versions. So they might get to a version something akin to a Type 21 uh, by 1942. But you have to admit, uh, again admit that the Allied ASDIC and ASW would be a lot better by 1942 as well. So it would be an interesting scenario. This one. Would an incendiary shell be viable for shelling land targets? Would be very effective against Japanese zone eyes. Yep. And the British do have a program for one. Jack Ray, German Model 2 new production. Make a prototype based on sound German over engineering. While taking it to the test range, it bursts into flames and spreads radiation. Hmm. 9681, how does all this affect the Cold War? Oh. I have, that's a whole too long, that's a whole distance down the road. It's very difficult to predict beyond a certain level. I'm trying to keep this within reasonable bounds of where I can actually be, give you answers. And the Cold War, I cannot predict how it would affect that. Yeah, I did think that was the base on German luck of things at Jack Ray rather than the actual some of that nuclear program. Andrew Cox, Lancaster didn't fly till nineteen forty one. In nineteen thirty nine it would be Wellington's the Hamptons. Oh good lord. <laughs> yeah, the Lancaster would come out looking something similar to the Manchester, I think, which is a longer range version of it. Manchester I'm sure about Manchester was the medium bomb that came to Lancaster. What was it in Lancaster which was the the, the, long, the one which came out of Lancaster which was the extended range version of Lancaster? Lincoln Lincoln, thank you, Derp Squad. Sorry, my heavy bombers. Why do we name them all for cities? Why can't we give them cool names? Why are they? Why are the, the, the why are the Royal Air Force nicking the town class cruiser names? Uh, Jeffrey de Havilland proposed the Mosquito Prize for the War in Real Life. Would this affect the development anyway? Um, could you use them effectively from Free China? Uh, actually, the interesting thing with the Mosquito is its wooden production made it actually not that good for Far East service. It actually caused a lot of issues with serving because of the scenario of serving in the jungles and the humidity of the Far East um, due to the temperates and the climates there. So it may have meant that the Mosquito, as we understand it, didn't come into service. May not. Um, Jeff Ryan, but Bismarck was commissioned in August 1940. Yes, Bismarck is commissioned in August 1940, but my theory is, in a nice way, this is starting off in February 1939. I'm fairly certain the war ends by... 1940, well, end of 1941, if not earlier, and I'm fairly sure any naval actions are fought, that are fought are going to be fought in the first half of 1940. So it would have to get, it would have to be built and deployed to the Far East and be part and integrated into the battle fleets by January 1940, and I don't see them getting that 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 them there that quickly. And also, it would be a fleet action. Uh, the British and Americans would keep the battleships together. And again, don't take this the wrong way, but I have a feeling the British and Americans would want to make sure any battleship action was dominated by the British and American ships. National pride, but also to make sure they get the lessons. And they would be providing the vast majority of the ships. It would be, it would not be even be funny how much it would be the newest ships on both sides. The newest and best ship battleships of both the Americans and the British would be ones out there. I know it's not your area, but with the experience of war with Japan, could we see an early improvement uh, movement to design because actually need two rifle? Potentially, it depends how much ground conflict takes place.
And Jeff Brown, I do understand why you're saying about Bismarck. And I, as I said, if the war goes on longer, then maybe. But the, my theory is it's roughly 10 months before they get to uh, before they start implementing in Japan, roughly. Which, if we start off the saying it's February, that means they're there by November 1939. That means it's going to start biting, and they're going to, the Japanese actions are going to be in the first half, uh, first quarter probably, of November of nineteen forty. So they're going to be January, February, March nineteen forty. And again, it's not just commissioning Bismarck; it's getting it to the deployed to the Far East and integrated into the force. I think you find Sha I think it wouldn't be surprised if Sharnos and Eisenhower get to fight the Congos. The Congos. I do not. I would not be surprised if that happens. I could well see a, uh, it, it could be an interesting thing because it could, they could join a form allied raiding groups. So it could be Hood and Scharnhorst and Repulse and Conga, uh, Repulse and Orenaum and Nisenau and whichever R class is left with one of the Dunkirks. That could well be a force, the force structure you see doing it being the heavy raiding surface raiders. And there could well be a battle between a couple of Congos, Hood and Scharnhorst. That could be a battle you could realistically see. It would be an evolved Lincoln. Night Americans, assuming their air bases in range of Japan, how long do you see Japan, particularly industry, holding out in reverse blitz scenario? Not that long. They don't have the infrastructure again, as Yonai complains. And also, they have far less depth of um, space to put their infrastructure in, because they're mostly they're mostly on the coast. Whereas the British have areas to put it in. They're both island nations, but the British can actually stick stuff internally, whereas Japanese mostly can't. In this European war, if there is still a battle of Denmark's Straits, it could be Bismarck and whatever escort goes with. A, a VS Vanguard and Lion. That's a big arch by Vesark. I'm thinking more it's a couple of lions. <laughs> going, I love Bismarck. And Bismarck going, um, I would like to declare <laughs> that this is not fair. <laughs> Maybe by the time of war in Europe, Germans actually lead jet technology and have them in service in meaningful numbers. Um, remember the British are developing jets as just as hard as the Germans. So whilst theoretically, uh, whilst we often talk about the Germans with their jet technology, the British are developing the Meteor and various other things from about this period as well. So yeah, you might you might well have Germans leading in jet, uh, might have jets in meaningful number, but the British probably have them as well. Not far, but won't be far behind, or will be equal. It will be about the same. It will be interesting. The British are. No, one of the interesting things is the Germans are very much pushing for a fighter bomber because that's what Hitler wants, whereas the British are prepared to accept just a fighter. They're prepared for a fighter. They, they're quite happy with a jet fighter. Um, so that actually might mean the British get in the service first. But the German might be a better one, in which case the British will develop a better one. And it, you could be talking about being on the second generation of jets by the time a European war happens, because it's after 1942, so it could be as late as 1945, 46, 47. I don't think you get out of the 1940s without a European war. Right, Americans, and this and uh, add the. On this, and Britain does well in the East in 1941 onwards. How does it affect Britain's Easter service policy in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? It depends on what the British economy is like. If the British has only had to fight the war in the Far East or the war in Europe, and that's had to fight the same two at the same time, then that's going to change the British economy. That's also going to change the way the British have acted in World War. Probably also it's changed the Commonwealth structure. And that it's probably pushed the Commonwealth towards a far more free uh, to a having a trade section. So the Commonwealth could well be it's uh, Commonwealth already is supposed to have empire uh, first scenario, but it could well have a large free trade and fair trade component within the Commonwealth, um, which could affect things. So it's it's gonna it, it could be interesting how it affects. I I honestly can't predict, but it could mean the Commonwealth fleet structure does get created.
Andrew Cox, the most modern battleships in both navies. The KGVs, Nelsons, modernized QEs combined with Colorados? Probably. That's not exactly... Uh, let's put it this way. That's not a group I would like to be taking on anytime soon. That's not a group I would... I, I'd quite happily avoid them. And you probably still have... In fact, here is a scenario which could well happen. You could very well find that Ching Li, if Cunningham is in charge of the entire fleet... Ching Li or some a similar, uh, you know, quite a prominent U.S. admiral like that could well have been found to be put in charge of the battle fleet as the second in command. Mm -hmm. Nimitz, uh, let's be honest, Halsey, Nimitz, possibly Sprunts, mm, they're all complicated. But again, Nimitz is not a fleet commander at this point, so Nimitz could also, you could end up with a combined fleet led by Cunningham and Nimitz. Anyone want to take that on? Really? Cunningham and Nimitz going, hello, hello, we're in charge of this week together. Yes, we're fighting Japan. Oh, goody. Nicole Ross, I disagree. I think Japan holds out for years. They didn't quit in the real, in the real Pacific War. Um, I can understand why you're disagreeing, but I don't think that happens. Again, the, the point is the faction in power in this period. This is the point. You have to deal with different factions in power. And this is a thing which factors their, their doctrine there, as I said at the beginning. If the, you have the pragmatic faction in power, that's what I call them, the pragmatic versus the um, obsessive, if they see a chance to preserve Japan and Japanese culture and Japanese society, rather than have it wiped out, they will take a honourable peace. And that is how the British would couch it. There is a different. A, a, it would. It could well be again different from a total war scenario, because it's not linked to Germany. It's not linked to. It's not linked to a war in Europe. It could well be a very different scenario. Could well be that they get League of Nations mandated. This is an interesting thing. You could end up with the League of Nations actually being the force mobilized to fight Japan and USA joining the League of Nations. And to be fair, they didn't quit in the real Pacific War because it took them years to get back to them. Again, in this scenario, as I've said, uh, Without the if without uh, without Indochina, French Indochina, Vietnam, they're not getting close to Singapore that quick uh, quickly enough to stop it before the ma major reinforcements arrive. Fleet. Uh, the fact is, the forces there are not going to be the C team or the B D team. They're going to be the A and B team. Um, you might even get the BEF deployed out there, and you get a movement up, and you've got such a huge performance of force already built into it. In combined Royal Navy, U.S. Navy, and French, uh, du uh, Dutch, as we've discussed, probably elements of the German and the Italian navies. The J the Japanese are going to be stronger resources again. They're not going to get the Dutch East Indies. They're not going to get the fuel from there. So they're stuck uh, with no fuel, and they're operating, and they have no supplies. There is a limit to how much they can do. There is a limit to how long they can go. And the pragmatic side could well, how to put it, if they've got a chance of an honorable peace, they could go for that. And that's what I think is going to happen. This is why I think, as I said, 1941 is about where I think it ends up. Dan Freeman, with a bit longer, the British engine moment could be very interesting by 1941-42 if everything is in halt of a battle broken. Yep. Let's take a moment. So the Japanese dodged the bullet by letting the ships go? Mm. Yes. <sighs> 
Hang on, hang on. I was wrong. Hornet was all wood too. Hmm. It would be interesting. Let me see if you put it. Would the Dutch get the battle cruisers they wanted, and the French get some kind of Riccolo classes? But so, do you reckon that's not very likely at all? It's a possible. Um, it's a possibility. I think the Dutch battle cruisers I can definitely see happening. At least one or two of them. Um, they wouldn't get them in time for the war, but they need them. Uh, they they'd see a need for them, so they probably build something like them. Uh, would they get? Would the French get a Riccolo class successor? Possibly. They would try for it. Whether the Rickaloos would actually be completed in time for service to properly serve in the war is another thing. They'd be like, it's kind of the infrastructure way of, again, like the Bismarck and Serpents. Dr. Alex, RNA never victim. If you're in a fair fight, you're doing it wrong. Yep. Dev Squad, uh, that is a mission. Yes, we've heard some stories about German developing jet engines. Crazy, eh? Brent. Oh, yes, we, we've heard that too. Would you like to see our versions? Yeah. Uh, Andrew Cox, the jet is an interesting one. The 004 wasn't really ready before the 44, but a lot of that was due to lack of advanced materials. The Derwent was less advanced aerodynamically, but could handle better. Hmm. Okay, come on. Given the history of British jet design, you could see a hybrid jet rocket fighter like the SR-3 by 45 instead of 1950, which gives you a carrier capable jet early. Whew. Potentially. Okay, Nimitz and Embassy. So we put Vien and Lee in charge of two flexible fast fighting groups and then send the main fleet into mop up after. Sounds good. Yeah. Remember, remember Vien is a, uh, a destroyer a flotilla commander at this point. He's not even in charge of a tribal class destroyer flotilla. Uh, that is, uh, another officer, so, yeah, this, this, this is, um, it would be interesting. They've still got good officers in the tribals, though, scary officers. Vision, the point is, the fraction in power in uh, Japan this time, 1959, wasn't dumb enough to go to war with the UK, US. Yeah, that's the <coughs> that's the point. There's a different faction in power. Uh, they're different. Nicole Ross, interesting. Three times Japanese fleet with just the U.S. and British fleets. Yeah, it's it, it's not a nice scenario. Alagar, even if the hardliners were in power in Japan during that war, it'd still be a lot shorter Model 2 was historically for them due to their worst stars and having to fight all other world powers. Mm-hmm. That's what. How does Admiral King react to the war? Uh, does he still end up as an Admiral Fleet? Well, as Dan Prima's has pointed out, explodes in range of having to work with British as the minor partner. Uh, he would probably want to be equal partners, and it would be a sort of equality re equality style, but it would be, as said, the British would be an aggrieved party, so uh, they would get the leadership. That would be how they would do it. And again, the French, and th that's the trouble. Once you're working in alliance, the French, the Dutch would be happy to work under the British. Um, the Germans and the Italians would probably be happy to work under the British. The Germans might try and make a fuss, but they would probably prefer to work on the British than the Americans, just to wind up the Americans, because it would be a European versus America, because that could see that as causing issues, and uh, that might be useful for them So uh, later, so they would probably go with that, and therefore, in a combined alliance, if all the Allies are prepared to work under one power, and they're providing more ships than you are, because they actually have more in service, even though you're supposed to be equal on paper, um, you end up with them as the leading power and you as the second. Um, as George Jimmy pointed out, William Lee was still technically chief of naval officer, uh, chief, uh, uh, chief, uh, of naval, uh, chief of navy or, or of the navy in 1939. So, yeah, he has the power.
Land Premium. Hornet and Mosquito were wood. Carbon fiber polymer rather than lumps of oak. Uh, because light metals like aluminium weren't available. Not because it was the best material. It was the best available. Yeah, again, if you have the aluminium supplies, etc., it becomes an interesting scenario. That's a the Against Locks odds is a fictional idea from a movie called The, F the Last Battle Cruiser covering the exploitation of Hood that sounds something like this. Uh, something wouldn't be made in this scenario. Honestly, in this scenario, as said, I think you have the fast ships available, which are the Dunkirks, uh, Sharnhorsts, Hood, Renown, Repulse, forming the raiding groups. And. You would have pairs of those going out now. If you have seven ships, you can usually probably guarantee at least two pairs out on opera, out on uh, out on action, and that's going to be hoovering up Japanese trade. So the Jap the, the other point is that you're going to have to make this is the Japanese are going to very quickly going to have to go. Do we have to use our battleships to escort our convoys because the, they have these fast battleship battle cruisers coming and attack them? Or do we have to start hunting down? Are we going to have to do mass air patrols? What are we going to be having to do? Where are we going to have to go for the, on this? And that's going to be an interesting scenario to see how they deal with. Knights of Grimm. Yeah, by the war starting in February 1939 and Hood not getting by the main line forty one. I expect Hood is still remembered as a mighty battle cruiser, not what we remember her as today. Well, she won't be remembered as getting sunk. I'm not sure if Hood gets to be a museum. Andrew Cox, off the bed. Take care. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Vision, what if US and Japan go to war off the USA, Pana uh, USS Panayans in January 1939? Similar reason, the British would end up involved in that. Um, I'm not going to get into the full scenarios of that, but if they did, and by the way, it's Mitsumas, uh, Mitsumasa Yonai who makes sure that the person who does the Panayans is fired from the Navy, and they do try and solve it. So he's the one who tries to keep peace that way. This is why I was quite happy to talk about Dirt Squad's plan of what happened. Well, surely he'd try and execute people, etc., for Birmingham, and I'm saying, well, there's a difference on the watch between them, and, and it's basically, as the consul puts it, it would be regarded as the Japanese government's fault, not the individuals on the site, but the government's fault. Because of the scenario. Um, Japan, my theory is, uh, the British would get involved, but they would be the second, because the J Americans would be the agreed partner. But the British would get involved for the same reason the Americans would get involved in this scenario, because they don't want to be left out of, they don't want to be the a superpower not at the peace table. That's what, add that the Germans had that leadership it did at the time and their views on the Jewish influence in America. Yep, it's fun. Andrew Cox, if the RN has to work with the Colorados, will they ca call any remaining R's over as well? They're still faster than Colorados. Probably not, because they're look uh, in the nicest way. The, uh, the British will call over the R's, depending on how many of the, uh, the German and Italian ships are in the Far East. If the Germans deploy both Scharnhorst and Neisen out, then they probably leave a couple of R's in the home fleet. And if they can get the Italians to send their new ships out, uh, then a couple of R's get left in the Mediterranean, and I wouldn't be surprised if Royal Oak actually ends up down at the Falkland Islands, start off with, and then goes and joins the the the, 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 the um, fleet in the Far East. Lehe, I think, was CNO in 1939, Nicolas, I think, Lehe. It might have been Stark, but I think it was Lehe, I think. All right, then. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, let me just check the details for this. I hope you've had a nice time. Thank you, as ever, for all the support on the Hyder stuff. Thank you for the support on the... <sighs> thank you for the support of tonight, of watching. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Thank you for all the generally, just the generosity you all give. It's just amazing. And as said, there is a uh, long patrol for this coming out on Saturday, which I hope you all look forward to and enjoy. And, ooh, I've had quite a few views this evening. All right, I'm going to answer all the questions, but we're now in sort of the end scenario. It's as 
10, it is 10, 10 past 10. Um, I think I've got to clean my floor from the smell. George Newman, Lee Hay at the start of 1929, Stark would take over 1st August 1929. So Lee Hay is in the, at the beginning in 19, in this point would be in there. So McLaren, here is the galaxy brain either. Well, all fleets are in the Far East, Germany could sea line. Well, first of all, they have to get through France. Then they have to get all the uh, little supplies, and then they'd be find themselves fighting the entire world. That would not be a good scenario for Germany. And also, even if they, again, there would be a large, again, there'd be a large army left in the UK. This is the point. There would be a large army left in the UK. The UK would not be, the Britain would not send all their forces and all their supplies out to the Far East. Trust me, there would be a large garrison sitting at home going, hello? Being the leading force here, what would Britain's post-war relationship be due to the USA? I think the reason Iran should be the US built ships was due to America doing the most um, in the Pacific. I would agree, and I think the uh, the Australians might stay as part of uh, far more integrated with the British system, but they still buy the um, Australians still buy the Type fourteen and uh, the Type twelves, the Leander class. So they're still sort of British orientated. It's mainly later Cold War where they go American orientated. That's not too legend. What the size of each individual world powers navy be after season one? The US, uh, UK, France, Germany, Italy, and the USSR. Much bigger. I can't predict exactly how big, but I think uh, in the Royal Navy would be far more. Uh, uh, Royal Navy, the battleship, uh, the capital ship force would be roughly in the 20s, a low 20s, 20 to 24. The carriers would probably be 18 or so, I think. And the US Navy probably about the same as the British. As for Germany, well, Germany, Italy, France would be basically hamstrung building the same as they were able to build because they're limited not by the war, but by infrastructure. Even in the war, they can't search more because of that. Netherlands might have a single battle cruiser constructed. The Japanese would have nothing left because the British would have destroyed it all, either in harbour or at sea, because that's the British methodology. The, 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 the nice way, the British would only start peace negotiations after they'd wiped out the Japanese Navy. Uh, USSR might actually have something in service. Who knows? It might actually build some battleships. Nick Ross, next bilge pumps. The bilge pumps this week has been delayed. As said, we had some, I had some issues with students, so the bilge pumps is coming out tomorrow. It's already uploaded, it's all done, it's just coming out tomorrow. At normal time, and I do apologize for it being delayed. Thank you, Bijan. Thank you for the Canada kind of trip. That's very kind of you. And that's called the Iron would leave just enough of the Isles in Europe to ensure German Italian fleet less in Europe weren't a threat to British dominance of the Atlantic and Mediterranean. Exactly. Thank you, Ryan Cash. John Jay, thank you. Lars McCaskill, thank you. Greetings from Cancun. Greetings to Cancun. Hello, Dirt Squad. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice one. I've got no questions for Glorious Heritage Cruiser. Thing. Oh, I'm sure you'll have questions for the GC, uh, the Glorious Heritage Cruiser. I'm sure you will do, Knight to Clary Horn. If you've watched the Long Patrol, I'm sure you have questions because let's put it this way: I could see you asking, "What? Uh, why is a cruiser not a capital ship? Why well, I'm calling it a cruiser, not a capital ship?" Because I think they get. I mean, that's not. I do wonder if they could have had larger ships in service. I do wonder why they don't. Thank you, Nighthair Reflections, and hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, Donner Gunhammer. Thank you, Alan Zaski. Thank you, Night 681. Oh, thank you. <laughs> There's always a legend of Grey Ghost. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Um, Calvin Osbert, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Off, to uh, Night Revolution, off top of question, you have at least two models in Falcons 82 with full air dro uh, drops. I think one ship's would be 55, 50, 56 air groups, uh, 55 to 60 strong by that time. Do you use buck, the Bucks uh, Phantoms to attack airbase on Argentina to prevent more exercise attacks? Yes. But honestly, I probably don't need to. I can probably use the Airborne Early Warning and the Phantoms to protect, uh, prevent against Argentine air attacks by using the Buccaneers to basically massacre the Argentinians on the islands. Thank you, Christopher Ryan, and thank you, George Newman. 
Does go. Australia becomes US orientated because of the agreement that everything east of Singapore was under US command and everything west was under U it was UK command in late 1942. <sighs> to an extent, yeah. Although the Australians are the premier users of the Matilda tanks, which is very sensible because, like to be honest, who best to waltz Matilda? Take care, my friend productions. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, everyone. And um, thank you. And I hope you enjoy the Long Patrol, which comes out tomorrow, uh, comes out Saturday. I also hope you enjoy the UAD video, which is coming out tomorrow. I think you're going to enjoy it. It's considering the 18 inch guns that we've been discussing today, it is rather topical. Take care, everyone, and have fun. Take care. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Take care. Bye-bye.